meeting here. And without further ado, we'll bring this meeting of the Board of County Commissioners to order. Um, could we please arise and say our invocation, please? Father Omar Reyes. We do have... Father Omar Reyes is coming. Good morning, Father. Oh, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Good morning. Now, let's remember we're all friends. If you came in looking for a fight, guess what you're going to find? Love. <laughs> Love. Hallelujah. <laughs> if you came in knowing that we're all pulling on the same rope, we don't have to wrap it around each other's necks. Thank you. This day is going to go very, very well. All Yay. of these people here are here to serve you, and despite what you might think, they all love you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, send down upon these county commissioners the spirit of wisdom, charity, and justice that with steadfast purpose they may faithfully serve their office to promote the well-being of all people and to protect the vulnerable. And may we with open hearts, come here to bring our petitions in a spirit of love and charity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. all. Thank you. Thank you, Father. That was wonderful. <laughs> they just needed a leader today. Right? <laughs> Very much appreciated. Oh, well, it should automatically. Oh, I forgot about that. I still don't have this. Let's just pause for one minute while I get my agenda up here for some reason. It's not I can see it. I would. Clearly. I know it won't work on my phone either. I just think that works. Just do guest on my phone. All right. We have one. Where did Tony go? Oh. Right here. Oh. Okay. We have one proclamation today for the Purple Heart Day. Reggie, introduce yourself when they hey, come Father up. Hey, Father Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I see. Now you're asking me different questions. So, uh, please come. Hello, Father. I haven't seen you in forever. It's been a while, my God. It sure has. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have Reggie Fujimoto, the director of the Pinellas County Veteran Services Office, joining me this morning, and he will be accepting the Purple Heart Day proclamation. The Purple Heart is the oldest military decoration still in present use and was initially created by George Washington in 1782 as the badge of military merit. The Purple Heart was the first American service award made available to the common soldier and is awarded to any member of the United States Armed Services wounded or killed in combat with a declared enemy of the United States. 
and the mission of Vietnam Veterans of America, chartered by an act of Congress, is to foster an environment of goodwill towards the Vietnam War veteran members and their families, to promote patriotism, to support related legislative initiatives, and most importantly, to make sure we never forget their sacrifices. Never again will one generation of veterans abandon another, and especially those awarded the Purple Heart Medal. And there may have been many Pinellas County residents who made the ultimate sacrifice in giving their lives in the cause of freedom. And there are numerous combat wounded veterans who currently reside in the county. And as Purple Heart awardees contribute to their community in countless ways, now therefore be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that August 7th, 2023 be recognized as Purple Heart Day. So we have this proclamation. I, I accept the, the proclamation for the members of uh, the awardees of the Purple Heart, some of which we have uh, present, uh, Father Bob Swick, uh, Mel Cheglin, uh, representing the uh, Military Order of Purple Heart. Uh, they're in my annual ear group, Vietnam. So uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for the sacrifices for for our country that we love. And how about this officer over here? Would you like to recognize him? Come on over here. Oh. <laughs> Come on. That's not fair. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here. What's your name? <laughs> Hello. I'm Commander Malkling of the Military Order of Purple Heart. And thank you, commissioners, for this uh, recognition. Uh, we recognized and uh, declared the county of Pinellas a Purple Heart County because of the way that they support not only Purple Heart veterans, but all veterans. So remember on August the 7th, not only just us that are standing here alive, that Purple Heart was given to the families of those that didn't make it home. Amen. Thank you so much. And you can see we all, what? Well, we all love you and we're all so grateful for your service. Thank you so much. And Father Zwick, you've been such a stalwart patriot to, of all these folks for so many years. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for allowing. Do you want to say anything? Everybody else? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I promise to keep it under a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to thank everybody. You know, uh, patriotism is not a lost virtue, but it needs to be nurtured. And uh, everyone in this room, I think we all have a responsibility to help the younger generations recognize what patriotism is all about. Amen. Hoorah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it helps if they put civics back in the classroom. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank all right, we're going to get our photo taken, so don't run off, especially you, because I know you're very shy. <laughs> Thanks for coming this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I'll call you. Because it's this week. This week. Okay. This week. Good to see you, sir. All right, Pastor. Yes, you too. See you, sir. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Thank you. I thought he was going to skip. Commissioners, while Commissioner Long is coming up, you got to meet Reggie. Reggie is our new Director of Veteran Services. Good to see you. Yes. And uh, so welcome. we're welcome to have him on board.
So I see we have a couple of folks from our audience that would like to speak this morning. And so let's have David Balagetis Jr. Please, David. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Chair. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. I'd like to talk about the roundabout in Palm Harbor on Alternate 19 as being an unnecessary road impediment that obstructs emergency vehicles. But before we get to the roundabout, let's talk about the water pipes in Palm Harbor. The water pipes in Palm Harbor are upwards of 80 years old and are in need of being replaced decades ago to include the sewer system that has fallen into des desperate disrepair and purposeful neglect. Let's talk about the roundabout as aiding a private political insurrection abetted in the center of a major transportation corridor. But before we talk about the objective of the roundabout, we need to talk about the fact that we need overpasses on US 19 25 years ago, clear through Wikiwachi. Where is the money for critical infrastructure needed for water and to ease the traffic jam on US 19? Is our government taxing the civilian population to support unwarranted public interests, such as the roundabout, using pu the public purse for personal gains selfish means and hidden objectives in its methodical and systematic development practices, establishing foundations to support private political fortifications and imposts, insurrections of such to be used for despotic private political <coughs> factions in government, dispositioning public monies to finance personal aggrandizements such as the roundabout while allowing our vital infrastructure to fall into a state of disrepair, misappropriating our tax money while aiding and abetting private political insurrections tyrannical in nature, pretentiously imposing fortifications as based on Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the U.S. Constitution, arbitrarily designing personal districts 10 miles square, giving rise to despotic water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment, attacking my religion of Christianity using the reclaimed water variance application. Such roundabouts are recognized not just as an act of rebellion, but as an actual invasion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Mack. Uh, good morning, Commissioners and, and the family here at uh, Pinellas County. Uh, I always look forward to having a word or two just to kind of uh, uh, be a citizen to be heard. Uh, this morning, I was just thinking about my life as a young, a young guy and how I feel like life had kind of sidetracked me, but yet uh, I didn't know how to, how to straighten it out. And it seemed like I didn't have the kind of people around me knew how to straighten it out either. So I, I made an endeavor to find out what life was about. I thought I had a gift. And uh, finally, I came to the realization it was kind of like uh, going to school. You remember, go to school and the teacher, we had these blackboards and they had crayon and they would write all the lessons on the board. And uh, at almost the end of the class, they would have somebody come up and erase that uh, board. And man, you look at it going out, it looked like nothing was there. And I found out that was really the problem with me. I, I needed a brand new slate. And you know, I, I got the privilege of uh, getting with a few people, and uh, one young lady showed me a verse in the Bible that says, Psalm 5110 says, uh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I mean, to me, that didn't make a lot of sense because really, as far as the Bible was concerned back in the day, I just thought it was a regular kind of book. But I found out it's not just a regular kind of book. And I found out that God uh, will create 
a, a new spirit within us and give us a brand new uh, way of life again, a brand new life. And as we study the Bible itself, we find it to be an absolutely true book. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says that of itself, but it's, that's how we know God because the Bible tells us about God. That's how we know Satan. The Bible tells us about the devil. They both are very real, and the Bible is very true. And I'm saying to us, I mean, if any of us are at the place to where we recognize that we need this new slate, God is here to give it to us. And that's what the Bible means when it says to us that a man must be born again. That's what it says to us. It says, if any man be in Christ, he's a brand new creation. God wants to give us a brand new life. He wants to come in and he wants to live in us as individuals as we walk by faith. That's the problem with our world today is people have been born wrong, born in sin and shaped in iniquity, but yet they neglect what God says to us about being born again, which really means we're born of God now. Man, we can do life the right way uh, because the new slate that God has given each one of us today. Thank you. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> now, is Mr. Fred Vanor here? Yes. Mr. Vanor, we have your memorandum that we're preparing to read into the record. Do you want to speak in lieu of that? Uh, which member can I approach? Yes, please. Thank you. First of all, I come in peace today. Good. And, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my friend Andrew Dennis was supposed to be here today, and he came over at 10 o'clock last night and asked me to sub for him because he had an emergency at work this morning. Uh, I'm not sure what memorandum. Are you speaking about the email? Yes. That I sent? You asked for it to be read into the record? Um, I didn't know it was. I sent one to you and Kathleen Peters. Okay. And um, could I say a few other words? Sure. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk about the Bay Point Stormwater Project. And <clears throat> um, I'm assuming that most of you know that it was a golf course there was supposed to be a green site, and they found hazardous waste. And fortunately, it became a brown site, which the county should get some monies back for remediation and so forth. And as the last four years that I spent uh, behind the golf course, I walked the three miles and enjoyed the wildlife and so forth. And we look forward to that as neighbors, uh, to do the same thing going forward. However, we found out just two weeks ago, two weeks ago, that we're going to have a 27-foot hazardous waste mound behind us, like feet from our property. And there's many, many issues involved there from our standpoint and also should be from Pinellas County standpoint on the liability issues. One is our children are going to take their bikes up and down that mound and they're going to get hurt. Teenagers are going to gather at what they call a sunset point that they're going to put on that mound, which incidentally, none of us are going to climb three stories to watch the sunset when we can see it right, sat, right outside our door. So um, <clears throat> we did have a meeting with 10 of the planners. I mean, 10 of us had a meeting with three of the planners. And they finally told us what the elevation was two weeks ago. And basically, we were appalled. And how, incidentally, in Ellis Counties, uh, this would be the highest mound in Pinellas County. And also, I don't think Pinellas County has really managed a 27-foot mound of hazardous waste. So what we're calling for is 
for the 12 or 15 around the mound of housing people to meet with the planners and maybe a, a commissioner a commissioner or an appointed person because we can figure this out. There are a multitude of opportunities all right, to make this beautiful and also accomplish the planning uh, uh, stormwater uh, guide. So thank you very much. I appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Peters. Um, so I, clarification, hazardous waste, this mound, I thought this was a berm for stormwater. This, Jill can come up and speak to us. So Kelly was well aware of this. Um, we had a brownfield application in, um, it was denied. Um, that's that's the most recent changes that the gentleman's talking about and <sighs> some of the issues that we're dealing with on sites since we purchased that okay, um, about so five I, years I ago. Okay, so I hadn't heard this was a brownfield, so we haven't been updated on this. Go ahead, um, Jill. Oh, I missed yeah, it. Sir, we have, I, or I, I missed it. I believe we've at least made an effort. Good okay. morning, Jill Silverboard, um, County Administration. <laughs> so the project, um, we have been working closely with the neighborhood. We did apply, as Barry said, for uh, a Brownsfield um, grant, and Jill, that was denied. could you pull your mics in so everyone can hear you properly? Thank so you. The, uh, the grant was denied. We're actually working with DEP as it relates to not hazardous, but there is chemical contamination, as we typically will find in a golf, golf course, course property, um, that we have to address. And we're at the very, very beginning of that permitting process with DEP. So it's very early in terms of the design. The 27 feet is not 27 feet above the current elevation of the property or elevations of the property. It, it, it would be, it would be a, a situation where we'd have, we believe we're going to have to do some excavation. And so we don't know what the finished elevation um, is, is going to look like. I think what we've shared would be the worst case. So our staff's prepared to meet again um, with this gentleman and his neighbor, and we'll you know, continue to go from there. But we have to clean it up. And DEP will help us determine what that looks like in terms of capping or, or removal. You know, so okay. we're very early, still very okay. early. Okay, so, so the cleaning up is essential for the health and safety of the residents. That's correct, since we did acquire it for stormwater purposes. Right, and, and originally the concern was that we we're going that developers were gonna develop that and there was gonna be apartments and condos on there. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we ended up protecting it for stormwater, mm -hmm. um, which is what the citizens in the neighborhood wanted. Um, but I think health and safety is gonna come first. And so, um, I, you know, I look forward to being in on the loop on this one to see how this plays out um, because health and safety is definitely first and foremost, and I know we're all on the same page yep, for that. Absolutely. Um, and so I guess what I'm going to ask you, sir, is that you and the and the residents be patient with our staff. And I think that, you know, the one thing Pinellas County staff is really good at is working with the community to make, uh, make it kind of work for everybody. And so I think due diligence is great. Stay on it like you are. Okay. Um, but patience is going to be okay. essential. Reason, excuse me. The reason that... <coughs> We felt what was really important is we gave them ideas and they said the sunset mound stays and that's it. Well, so it, it sounds like what, we're not done yet. That's so, what we were told. Yeah, so I appreciate it. sounds like we're not done yet, so patience is going to be... Um, and I'll pass that word along. Thank you. Thank you and very much. And please keep sending us the communications. We will. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank and you. for the record, if I may, the Bayfront... The Bay Point golf course has been on our agenda at the county commission for years we've been working with that community so they're not strangers to us and we all have been involved in ensuring that the health and safety were most important for everyone and I do believe and I don't see Kelly here but we had somewhat of the same kind of issues when we set about to excavate Lake Seminole and there was a huge mound on, over in that area. Has not turned out to be a problem at all. And the lake is thriving today. And so not too many years ago, it was almost turning into a dead lake. So I think you can have confidence that going forward, we are very focused on doing all of the right things on stormwater maintenance in okay. our county. 
I appreciate it. Thank you for being here today. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Okay. And that is, unless there's anyone else in the audience. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Pound, how on earth could I not bring you up here? You want to talk about children and families. That's right. Greg Pound with SavingFamilies7 at gmail.com. A verse out of Malachi, the very last verse in the Old Testament of the Bible, of the King James Bible. It says, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. I'd like to put this up so, um, so it could be seen. This is a newspaper article, no pictures, just a news article I want people to see so they can look it up. This is what you can go ahead and read and see how many thousands of dollars have been given trying to draw in the gay community into Pinellas County. I've been with AFA, American Family Association, since 1992, trying to defend and protect our families of Pinellas County from the onslaught of sodomites coming in and trying to destroy our family. Their first goal is to separate the men from the women, destroy the family, divide and conquer is what it is. And ever since I've been involved in this, I've been under a constant attack and barbarment from these people and the power of influence they have over our county leaders and those in positions of authority. And what they're doing is their goal is to destroy our families and to sodomize our children. This transgender crap and what they're doing, I've got one news article after another here. From it's, it, You can't make it up. You look up to De La Cruz children who were molested, used over and over again, just like, I mean, like, you couldn't make it up. The De La Cruz case, you can read that when you got Richard Simmons coming in talking about dipping children in talk and chocolate, little babies and licking the chocolate off them. I mean, these, these are news articles that we have. I mean, it's just one right after another. I keep these. I go ahead and get these. I mean, here you got porn, child porn charges in, uh, in here in Largo. with um, in, I mean, these were police officers. And so what happens, it doesn't matter. I mean, we cannot aid and abet this kind of corruption that's going on in our society to destroy our families and get our children. And so, I mean, the Bible says God's going to hold us responsible, especially the men. He's going to hold the men responsible to protect the children. Okay, this stuff, what we've seen at this parade downtown St. Pete and other activities going on in this county is unacceptable. That's why they shut them down over there in, in Tampa, close that parade down, and so forth. And so what, we need to follow suit because their, their goal is to pervert the next generation and our children. And so it's just a real sad situation. Our families are under attack. And I've done everything I can in the past 32 years to build, build our families up. And, and instead of being, instead of being um, helped, I've been attacked. I'm being attacked by people in positions of authority who come in and tell you to shut up and just let things go the way they're going. And I'm not going to let America go the way to Sodom. And, this is, and we have people in positions, high positions of authority and power. You look at this article about, you read it, Pinellas County gets okay. To, for gay tourism it's and read how many thousands of your tax dollars in Pinellas County has been given in order to bring people like this into our county to take it over and to get a hold of us and our children and influence us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so is there anyone else that would like to speak? Because that's the end of our citizens' comment today. And we are moving on now to our public hearings, which is the countywide planning authorities. Carolyn. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Agenda item number three is case number CW2305. This is a proposal by the City of Pinellas Park to amend the countywide plan map from retail and services to employment regarding 12.9 <laughs> acres more or less, located at 10601 U.S. Highway 19 North. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And I understand we have two citizens that would like to be heard on this item. And the first one will be Jamie Meyer. Jamie, please come forward, state your name, and you'll have three minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Jamie Meyer for um, 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 3700 with Howard Henderson. I'm actually the um, agent for the property owner who is the applicant before Pinellas Park. Correct. Um, so I am available for any questions, but I know this is the application of the city of Pinellas Park, and so I will speak if I if there's anything I can offer that is helpful. Um, and my, I also have 
Matt Silverain from Gulf Coast Consulting, who is available for the same um, reasons. And um, we are requesting, we've already actually gotten approval from the city of Pinellas Park, of course, pending approval before um, Pinellas County, um, to go from uh, retail and services to employment. So we're increasing, we're pro proposing to increase the amount of employment uh, in the in city of Pinellas Park. It's a, an existing warehouse that's very large and it's gonna stay on site. The goal is to be able to have open storage more freely on the site as well, because there's a lot of unused space. And so under the old category we were under, we could only use 20% of that. And so that's the goal here. So if there are any other questions, I'm available, but um, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. So are there any questions or comments from the board at this point? Do we need a presentation or anything like that? No. no. Move approval. Second. Okay. It's been moved and approved. And uh, do you want to open the card so that we can vote, please? And I don't know what Lou. It's not on mine. Lou? It's right there. Hold on. It's real small. Yes. There you go. Can you, you, it over there? you voted. You're golden. It's only going to come up on the bottom of mine. Um, really? It was, this is your vote. <laughs> it was there. I, well, I assume you have me as a yes. I think it's gone. So that motion passed unanimously, and now we are on item four. Agenda item number four is case number CW2306. This is a proposal by the City of Tarpon Springs to amend the countywide plan map from residential medium to public semi-public regarding 1.06 acres, more or less, located at 200 Dixie Highway. The public hearing was properly advertised, and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk, and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. All right, what are the wishes of the board? Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Can you open the machine? No. It's a little new. Here we go. I see. There it is. It just looks different. Why is this doing this? I can't get it. And that passed unanimous as well. Okay, so that motion has been approved, and now we are on case number five. Agenda item number five is case number CW23 07. This is a proposal by Pinellas County to amend the countywide plan map from employment target employment center and no designation to public semi-public and target employment center regarding 18.5 acres more or less located at 13690 Stony Brook Drive. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. I move to approve that. I'll second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, Sorry, Madam Chair, who was the first and second? Kathleen and Brian. Thank you. So, could you open the machine, please? <clears throat> and that motion passes. And now we are on item number six. Agenda item number six is a proposed ordinance amending the countywide plan. This is the first of two public hearings. The public hearing was properly advertised and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk. The matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Thank you. Commissioner, hey last, uh, last Thursday you asked for a presentation right. in the field study. So Rodney's up and ready to go. You call it support. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Good morning. Rodney Chapman, division manager with Fort Pinellas. Um, with me today is Jared Austin. He manages special projects for our agency, and he served as the lead uh, 
staff person for a couple of the substantive changes to the countywide plan, and he'll walk you through a brief presentation in a few minutes. But before I turn it over to him, just wanted to give you a little bit of context. Uh, so as you all know, the countywide plan guides how our city and county planners regulate redevelopment. Um, but as we've seen over time, uh, Pinellas County has less and less vacant land, and so redevelopment becomes more and more challenging. So the countywide plan has to evolve and change to respond to those changing conditions around the county. Um, this is pretty common. This is our fifth amendment package to the plan since 2015. Um, I know it seems like a lot, but most of these changes are either implementing the recommendations from some of our recent studies, they are uh, codifying some of the administrative interpretations that we make as staff uh, to our city planners. Uh, and some of these changes will also reorganize and clarify uh, some of the tools that planners can use uh, as they regulate redevelopment. Uh, as always, we place a high priority on collaborating with our city partners, and they have thoroughly vetted these changes and uh, support uh, these changes um, in their entirety. Uh, we believe these changes will um, streamline our processes and create the flexibility that's needed to allow for us to enable the right type of development in the right place. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jared and he'll walk you through uh, two of the most substantive changes in this amendment package. All right, well, good morning, everyone. As Rodney mentioned, my name's Jared Austin. I'm a principal planner with Ford Pinellas, and today I'll be walking through these proposed changes. Um, beginning first with what is probably the most substantive set of changes, which relates to our Target Employment and Industrial Land Study, or our TEALS update, as we're calling it. Um, so no news to many of you, um, our county is what we consider a redeveloping county, meaning that we have very limited land countywide for new development. And those vacant lands that we do have, specifically our employment and industrial lands, are really critical to the continued economic vitality of our county, um, given that we are the second largest manufacturer in the state next uh, only to Miami-Dade. Now these lands, given that they are vacant, um, have come under a lot of pressure over the years to convert to other uses, namely residential and commercial uses. Um, and this is a challenge that was identified as far back as 2005, um, beginning with the Pinellas by Design work that led to the original Target Employment Industrial Land Study of 2008. Um, and in fact, a lot of what came out of that study is what you see um, on the map there. Those large purple areas are what we call our target employment centers. Um, they had a number of incentives associated with them really designed to um, kind of allow for uh, major target employment investments to come online, especially coming out of that 2008 recession. Um, we've had a lot of time to reflect on these policies, and obviously the nature of work has changed uh, substantially since 2008, as well as in the post-COVID environment. And so we really wanted to take a look um, at these uh, under, in some finer grain detail, which was really um, the purpose of the TEAL study. Um, a lot of what was done back then um, in the policy that has remained up until our recent TEALS update was a very uh, restrictive preservationist policy. And while many of those policies were somewhat successful in seeing a return of a lot of our uh, major target employment and industrial uses um, come online throughout the county, they have had some challenges as well namely in terms of they are very limited in the flexibility they allow. Um, and again, speaking to the nature of employment and how it has changed, it has really not um, been accommodating for some of those more modern employment uses. Additionally, having this preservationist approach has really had a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, mentality towards industrial land. So whether you're an industrial property in the Joes Creek Industrial Park operating as a warehouse or whether you're Jabel, they're effectively treated exactly the same by the current countywide policies. So we were proposing to update that and change that with a more subcategorization approach. When I say subcategorization, I mean moving towards uh, employment categories that are better reflect the nature of employment that we have throughout the county, whether we're in Gateway, whether we're in the city of Oldsmar, as well as potentially expanding some of these target employment centers and some areas that we see as being primed for redevelopment, such as in uh, the countryside uh, mall area, downtown St. Petersburg, and so on. And this map here just reflects some of how we plan to break up some of these existing target employment centers and proposed target employment centers with some of these subcategories. <laughs> Now, in terms of the subcategories themselves, what are we proposing and what exactly are they? Um, the first being our target employment <coughs> center urban category. This is really designed um, to be for those employers that want to be in a class A office environment. They want to take advantage of primarily our downtowns. They want to be in that live work play environment. 
Um, and so because these want to be in our downtowns and we want the, them to be able to utilize as maximum space as possible, we are proposing a maximum floor area ratio of an 8.0. And for properties 15,000 square feet of, or greater, Class A office will actually not count towards that maximum allowable FAR. Um, so in the example on the bottom right there, we have that orange station where you see that Class A office sort of on the bottom and then the residential above. We would actually not start counting towards that maximum floor area ratio until we get towards that residential category. Um, so we, again here trying to incentivize a greater mix of uses. For the Target Employment Center suburban office, um, this is more like that Jable property. Again, they want a lot of the similar things as the Target Employment Center urban category. They just typically want to do it on a larger, more horizontal site. Think of more of a campus style development, again, utilizing Jable as an example. Still allowing for the residential, retail, and commercial uses, just as long as we have uh, Target Employment uses uh, done concurrently with those developments. Additionally, we have the Target Employment Center Suburban Industrial category. This is really what we think of when we think of traditional manufacturing, some of the Central Gateway area, Oldsmar, um, areas that typically have a larger, more horizontal property um, and really tend to benefit from uh, the Pinellas County Employ uh, Employment Sites Program that helps them really expand and kind of meet new regulatory standards. For here, we're proposing a maximum floor area ratio of a 3.0, and for properties 25,000 square feet or greater, the actual industrial and manufacturing space would not allow or would not count towards the maximum allowable FAR allowing some greater commercial flexibility and concurrent with target employment Manager, uses. I had a question. Oh, excuse, yes. me, excuse me, Is Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Um, on, you, you just mentioned Oldsmar, and yes. I see there's two distinct areas, one in the downtown that makes sense to be the blue that we're looking at. So you, you also said they were probably one of the highest manufacturing yes. areas. And we're using the suburban office there instead of suburban industrial. Yeah, so actually that map that I had shown um, initially with some of the subcategorization breakdown, um, it's mainly just to kind of highlight uh, basically what we're proposing in terms of the subcategories, but we've actually further refined those with each of the municipalities, and actually the majority of uh, uh, Oldsmar is going to be suburban industrial with some of that more, uh, I'll go back, uh, some of the uh, more central Oldsmar uh, near their downtown, and then uh, that parcel, set of parcels there on the left is actually going to be the office okay. category. So it, so it is going to be a Yeah, we, I, I should have uh, professed that. We have met with each of the okay. locals, and Perfect. so some of those, yeah, have Thank changed you. based on their feedback. Thank yep. you. Um, the last category is Target Employment Center Local. This is really designed to be the most flexible um, of uses. The only uh, thing that we are requiring here from the locals is a special area plan that sort of guides the redevelopment of these properties. And that's just so we're not having industrial land conversions that don't really make sense for a broader vision. So prime example of an area that's suited for TEC local would be the um, uh, Warehouse Arts District in the city of St. Petersburg. A lot of industrial space, um, but really for a lot of their um, sort of vision to come online, the current uh, countywide policies towards industrial lands and employment lands don't really make a whole lot of sense for that area. And so we want to allow them the greater flexibility to really establish that vision long term. One more question. Mm -hmm. sure. um, and there, there was um, legislation this past year or the two years ago that changed how we can do things or how restrictive we are. Right. We were obviously moving in this direction anyway. <clears throat> so how does this mesh with what the, the state has mandated for local. Yeah, so we actually believe we're pretty in line with the state. Um, we are, again, opening up that flexibility. We're much less restrictive than what um, the rules have been currently. We're allowing that greater flexibility. Really, the only thing that we're um, kind of requiring, in addition to these more flexible uses, is that we just have some sort of target employment done concurrently with, say, the retail, residential, commercial, so that we aren't you know, having the retail residential side come online and then we never get the target employment component. As so, well. for the record, we were yeah. moving along. At yes, pace definitely, anyway, so. definitely. Yes. All right. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Latvala. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know uh, soon after the pandemic, there was um, a lot of availability with commercial buildings, mm -hmm. uh, which drove down the price because mm -hmm. uh, people were working from home and remotely. Yes. Is that still the case that y'all are seeing? So actually, um, that's a very good question. That's something that came out through the study. So while yes, um, we do have, we do see a lot of and more of the class A office users um, kind of having that more hybrid um, environment. The reality is, is it's still a primarily a hybrid environment. So they still will maybe be coming in 
Mondays and Wednesdays or Monday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, but they're still utilizing the office space. With that said, though, a lot of the target employers um, that we did uh, work with that have been experiencing some of that, when they do want folks to come back in the office, they want there to be things for them to do in the area. So again, allowing the the commercial, uh, retail, the restaurants, all of that sort of stuff to happen in conjunction with the target employment, we think is really going to uh, help them maximize the sites uh, and really uh, accommodate their workers accordingly. So, and thank you for that. So yeah. you're not really seeing um, a lot of available, like abandoned commercial real estate buildings yet not, or anything Not like really that. in Pinellas. And in fact, our commercial real estate is, is quite hot for the region, um, especially within the downtowns, um, downtown St. Petersburg, notably, um, we're still seeing uh, quite a high demand. At least that's what the numbers uh, were showing when we were doing the, the study. So okay. thanks. Yep. Anyone else while we're paused here? No. I'm just going to wait till they finish their presentation. Okay. No, that's mm -hmm. fine. Please continue. Yep. Um, so the next set of changes is related to um, what we are calling the Ford Pinellas Multimodal Accessibility Index, or MAX Index. And this relates to how we uh, take into consideration transportation impacts to proposed uh, countywide uh, map plan changes. Um, so basically how it works currently, say that we through Ford Pinellas have a proposed land use change come to us, say it's going from an office to a residential use. We look at a number of countywide considerations. These could be, is it going to impact the coastal high hazard area? Is it adjacent to another community? And finally, uh, is what is the roadway level of service adjacent to the proposed development look like? Now we've used level of service as our primary transportation metric for quite some time now and throughout this process we've seen a number of challenges with it. The first and foremost relates to the fact that we're a redeveloping county. So using level of service um, as a primary means of evaluating transportation impacts puts us very rely, uh, reliant on what's called volume to capacity ratio. So the only way for us to improve the level of service on a roadway is to increase capacity, which means a roadway expansion, which we are finding increasingly challenging to do, and is quite strenuous for a local government and a developer um, to have uh, to, the burden placed on them for a proposed land use change. Additionally, it's only me measured on major roadways during peak times, so if we have a proposed um, land use change that's falling on local roadways, we have no means to evaluate the proposed level of service impact of that land use change. So that is why we are proposing what's called the MAX Index. It is essentially a computer program that will run um, and break the entire county into these quarter mile grid cells and it assigns points to those grid cells based on a number of multimodal features within them. Um, we use a quarter mile because that's sort of the industry standard for a reasonable walkable travel shed. It looks at everything from bike lanes and trail access and also does still account for level of service and volume to capacity ratio. It's just no longer the primary factor because we believe this gives a greater deal of flexibility to developers and local jurisdictions for getting these changes approved. Um, what we would be requiring um, because the countywide, uh, the MAX index would score these different areas based on those factors is that they meet the countywide average or better, which is currently a 7.5. If they don't meet that score, all we would require is that just as we do currently with level of service standards or coastal high hazard area, any number countywide consideration, we just need some sort of balancing criteria from the local government for why this should still be approved. Perhaps they've gotten uh, negotiated with the developer to provide a better sidewalk improvement, trail connection, um, whatever the case may be, there's a number of uh, options available for them. Finally, um, the, this package also contains a number of smaller amendments. These are in response to requests that we have received from local government and county partners. Most of these changes in particular are not substantive. They reorganize and clarify um, provisions that are already in the rules today, or they codify practices that are allowed today but are currently not spelled out in the rules. Um, and our colleague Linda Fisher um, is here for questions on these items as well. Um, so for countywide plan map amendments in the coastal high hazard area, we are proposing that applicants provide additional justification and analysis of evacuation zones. This is information that we already asked for, but it's not on the list of form formal requirements, so we do want to add it. And we have co coordinated with Pinellas County Emergency Management um, on this section. Uh, we also need to reorganize uh, a new state managed density bonus for redevelopment, <clears throat> or excuse me, for developments that recycle gray water. Um, that's household wastewater other than sewage. 
We were also asked by the county to allow for density bonuses to incentivize enhanced stormwater improvements. Uh, so we've included proposed language for both of these things in the rules. <laughs> We are also proposing a general cleanup of the current provisions for transferable uh, or transferable development rights, density averaging, and density pools. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have received a lot of feedback from local governments um, that this part of the rules is very difficult to navigate, and so we're just reorganizing and clarifying what is there today. Um, these are not substantive changes. We are also proposing to spell out a process where counties and cities can jointly um, plan for activity centers and multimodal corridors. That is already allowed today and it's been done before, but we had to uh, request to clarify how that process works in the rules. And then finally, we are also proposing some basic housekeeping changes uh, to things like our review deadlines, legal advertisements, uh, requirements, and so forth. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to take any additional questions that you may have. Questions from the commissioners? <coughs> Commissioner Flowers. Thank you. Um, thank you for the um, updated presentation. For the level of service yes. um, that's being proposed, and I notice here that um, mm -hmm. the, the information provided to us says that it would not require a local development review, but when you look at the even the Arts Warehouse District in the city of St. Petersburg, if you mm -hmm. are looking at 31st Street going back towards 22nd, which that's a warehouse, that's considered a warehouse district, but there's a lot of residential mm -hmm. because that's how the city was built. And then you have the warehouse district on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and that level of service, if there's increased traffic, does affect those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So was there any conversation about how you would or how this change could potentially affect them and whether or not um, there would need to be something included in in their plan that speaks mm -hmm. to perhaps an increase because you're gonna we're gonna get calls from residents right. saying you know we only have 15 cars going down my street now i have 35 to 40 mm -hmm. you know five times a day because of whatever business may be on the bottom floor mm -hmm. um even with a new construction there's a new development on the corner of fifth avenue and 28th street <clears throat> which is business and then right mm -hmm. across the street it's residential mm -hmm. um so was there any conversation about that? So um, we haven't met specifically with the Warehouse Arts District on this proposed change, um, but we have throughout this entire process been uh, in close coordination and collaboration <laughs> with um, City of St. Petersburg, um, transportation planning and engineering staff, as well as their land use folks. Um, and they have weighed in on this heavily. Um, certainly we understand their concerns um, and the challenges in there. And I think that um, you know, that area is already pretty strong um, in some of the multimodal investments, and we want to continue that moving forward so that exactly when we are encouraging those mixed-use developments, when they do come through our process, we can negotiate continued improvements in that area, um, okay. certainly. And we may find some of that also in Lelman, um, <clears throat> right. because Lelman yes. has those pockets mm -hmm. of yeah. um, industrial that, yeah. you know, years ago no one was really looking at zoning. Yeah. So people were just putting businesses wherever, and yeah. so... You know, when you have communities that look at trying to put something in yep. place so that it constitutes where something can go versus cannot, mm -hmm. um, I think it may be some some additional conversation sure. in the area. And I should also just note, too, um, I, even though I did use the Warehouse Arts District as an example for the Target Employment Center local category, um, the Lelman CRA did approve funds for a master planning mm -hmm. initiative there, mm -hmm. and that is actually going to kind of kind Overlay. of kill two birds with one stone. It will also serve as a special area plan for our target employment center requirements mm -hmm. um, so that they can continue to, you know, enact that vision for that area and not run into, you know, more of the regulatory hardships that maybe have been in place in the past at our level. Okay. So. And my next <laughs> question is, and you all may have talked about this, mm -hmm. um, but for the under three transfers of density and intensity, um, of course, recent legislation <laughs> took a little bit of that away from us mm -hmm. as it relates to being able to address that mm -hmm. um, when negotiating new developments, redevelopments, mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So um, if we are looking at, and I'm going to, the word here used is transferable, I'm going to say grandfathering, because mm -hmm. if a new business comes in, they get the density and intensity <laughs> that's currently there. Mm -hmm. So the mechanisms that may be in place for a requested increase because if you're going up levels, you're increasing your density. Mm -hmm. Was there any additional discussion in that area as it relates to the new um, legislative policies that have come down that says what we can and cannot do 
for e redevelopment or new construction? Sure, Commissioner. Um, we work closely with our city partners, and the city of St. Peter in particular has concerns about the new the legislative preemptions because what it's doing is it is um, removing some of those um, incentives that uh, the city has worked well and hard on putting in their code and standards. And so now the state has come along and preempted those things. And so they're finding that it's, it's going to be a bit of a challenge to get the, cap the, the right type of development in the right place because now some of the structures they had in place are no longer valid. Uh, and we may see that in Clearwater. Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, this is St. Pete, Clearwater, Largo are, are coming to us with those same concerns. Okay. And... Um, I, I really appreciate the adding the level of higher review for coastal high hazard um, yes. development mm -hmm. because um, there's just a lot that goes on with that. And then after the fact, we have some unintended consequences for mm -hmm. what may be occurring um, to communities or developments that may have been there for a while. Um, we have that in Clearwater currently with the condo uh, and the development that's going right next door. Um, and so I'm, I'm really um, grateful for that. And then if you don't mind me asking, I see that um, Mr. Smith was the only person that voted nay. Do you mind sharing what the rationale was behind that? Uh, sure. Uh, Commissioner Smith from the city of Largo was, um, felt that the changes were a lot. Um, and um, he just was uncomfortable with supporting this amount of changes all at once. Our rationale for doing all of this at once is that we um, don't want to inundate our process every few months with, with these changes. So what we try to do is we try to bundle them so as we have um, enough of substantive changes uh, ready to go, then we'll bring those forward at once. And um, he just had an issue with the amount of changes that we're proposing uh, at one point in time. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So it occurs to me that in listening to you and also being a member of Forward Pinellas that these things we're experiencing right now are really a good example. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Are a good example of unintended consequences taken by the state when they don't fully have an understanding of how it impacts the real world and the residents living, living in it. Would you say that was accurate? You are 100% correct in uh, so, just in the circles that we communicate in. In your area, I yes. get it. Mm -hmm. But Barry, if you don't mind, and I see Brian in the back there and I know this isn't necessarily his <laughs> primary responsibility right now, but it has been, this is a good um, thoughtful process to put forward when we have our joint legislative meeting, I think, to give them an example of how these kind of things have real world impact. And maybe they could be just a little more thinking that way when they are trying to advocate on our behalf. Mm -hmm. That it may sound good from a statewide policy, but we're all different and we all have different demographics and I think it's important to take those things into consideration. Yes, that's right. Mike. So, and for Forward Pinellas, when we develop our legislative package, if we coordinate with that of the county and the county commission, it makes a stronger argument. Mm -hmm. like Commissioner Scott? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Are we, um, since we're talking a lot about the changes the legislature made and some of the, the appro uh, approvals that have occurred without the commission being involved, are we keeping track um, and, and communicating the information? Basically, I'm looking at we've lost just in St. Petersburg over 35 acres of employment and industrial um, just in the last 12 to 16 months uh, to go to residential. Yeah. Not that we don't need the residential. Right. There's that, and that balancing act. But how are we keeping track of that? How are we communicating that with to the city councils and county commission? Um, That's so a that we phenomenal keep an question. Eye on the ball. You just teed it up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jared and I and Linda were having this conversation a couple weeks ago about how do we provide insight because one of the roles that we serve around the county is a clearinghouse. So mm -hmm. we share with our local planners what is going on outside of the jurisdictions. And so technology is a great thing and we have the capability of developing a dashboard which uh, we have a working beta test yes. version right now mm -hmm. that will be fed from the locals sharing with us the, the projects that they have received and are, have approved. 
and we are um, hoping to roll out this dashboard that will track these projects across the county in the fall. Yeah, yeah I, you know, it again, we all know the need for, for residential yep. uh, inventory increases, um, but we saw a 30 acre site in St. Pete mm -hmm. that had been industrial for a long time and mm -hmm. uh, folks in the neighborhood wanted to keep it industrial. They, they didn't mind the nine to five, Monday to Friday, right. but the 24 hour residential um, caused some concern. But that would have come to us at some mm -hmm. point, but now it's already approved right. and on its way mm -hmm. uh, because of legislature changes. But yep. mm -hmm. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Janet Barnett. Yeah, I'm so sorry, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. You got to speak up down there. <laughs> he's, he's been yeah. uh, just a quick question. So, on the max scores, yes. So, uh, assigning it to quarter mile grids. Well, mm -hmm. Let's say that you have a development that's going to intersect four corners. Yes. So how, how does just explain that? Great question. Um, yes. Yeah, so, in the instance that we would have uh, a particular parcel that inter uh, intersects a multitude of these grid cells, we would take the average of them um, and combine them. Yeah. So. Thanks. Anybody down? Oh, Commissioner Eggers. Yeah, again, thank you uh, for the report, and um, we've spent a lot of time going through this. Um, I know that when we had some licensing issues, this is in a different arena than you all, um, and some of our sub-licensees, um, there were some issues with, with the state, um, and they reached out and worked very closely with us to try to figure out how, how best to move forward on that so that we don't hurt the local businesses more than we're helping them. Right. I mean, I think we're trying to protect our residents. We're trying to help our businesses. So um, <coughs> I would suggest that we continue to do what we do yep. and, and mm -hmm. keep hammering the, the fact that we are a, we have available knowledge mm -hmm. and expertise that we can help move along their agenda, which ultimately is not that different than ours. Sometimes they just think they want to get there sooner than we're ready. Right. Um, and how they get there might be a little different. So I, I would just, you know, again, um, I don't think we're happy sometimes when the state <laughs> supersedes what we want to do. But I, I, not all the time are mm -hmm. they on the wrong path. But I think we mm -hmm. could help steer them a little bit in some of their policy making. Sure. Uh, but we have to really be a strong voice. Um, mm -hmm. find, a, find a person, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and really absolutely. bend their ear. I mean, I think we've got some good things that are going on already. But we just got to keep keep working that because mm -hmm. um, at, at the end of the day, we got to make sure we protect this land Absolutely. for jobs and mm -hmm. residences, mm -hmm. more pe places to live, et cetera. But mm -hmm. thank you. Appreciate all your hard work. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Lavelle, do you have anything? No? Commissioner Peters? No, no thank you. Everybody good down here? All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, David Balagetti, Jr., on the topic, right? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Uh, I live at Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Um, I'll try to stumble my way through this a little because I have some uh, unclear thinking as to what's moving forward, um, particularly in with uh, some of these initiatives uh, with Forward Pinellas. Um, this agenda item um, makes reference to permitting uh, third-party facilities not the county utility, but, but facility special rights to annex unincorporated property as a targeted incentive, um, which seems to be unclear as to what type of special rights um, this agenda item allows uh, third party development practices in developing of a local jurisdiction uh, a process of what's being called a transfer of development rights uh, relating to and recognizing gray water incentives as a redevelopment bonus uh, plan. Um, I, I question as to what type of, of powers and, and functions that uh, Pinellas County Home Rule Charter Section 2.04Q allows this uh, third party to acquire in its development of a taxing base against the residential community in uh, development of gray water um, uh, um, uh, development practices. Um, I see that again in statute 15303 uh, section 5 that this uh, reclaimed water variance of such is uh, claiming 
eminent domain development rights. And um, again, as I had mentioned in a, a, a House bill back in 2012, where uh, reclaimed water was to be used for laundry and toilet use uh, inside of our homes, I feel as though um, our equity in our homes may be subjected to a third party uh, taxing uh, levy uh, to support this uh, initiative and transfer of development rights um, and uh, special rights in this particular agenda item I call into question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments? Move approval of the item if there are no further. And this is just, no, it's just a Oh, I'm sorry. Two hearings, right? I'm sorry. It's the yeah. first of two public hearings. So no, no action. Let's forgive me. No action. Next time. No action required. <laughs> we'll remember time. that next time. You yeah, get the next bonus. time. <laughs> remember that next time. Yes, we'll be Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now we are on item seven. That's consent agenda. Consent agenda. Seven. Item seven to approve. Move approval of the consent agenda. Is there, well, is there any? Second. Okay, it's been moved by Commissioner Flowers, seconded by Commissioner Lavalla. All those in favor? Or let's open the card. We do we need a voice vote. Voice vote on this one. Voice. Voice. I'm so sorry. I'm losing my voice. A voice voice vote on this item, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we are on county attorney. I'm 13. What is going on with my notes? We are on item 13. And commissioners, if I could um, move item 14 up um, so we could um, address that and then we'll come back to the regular agenda. Sure. Um, so item number 14 is a recommendation to fund the revised request for the Dolly Museum. Um, as you recall, there we did pro you did approve in 2019 a request <coughs> for $17.5 million. We've yet to conclude that. However, there was modification, so I'd ask Brian Loeck, our interim director, <coughs> uh, to come forward and provide um, just a brief summary of the request and some of the staff recommendations. Good morning, Commissioners. Brian Lowack, Visit St. Pete Clearwater. As Barry said, I'll do my best to summarize uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, in 2019, the Dowley Museum came forward um, with a request uh, for capital funding out of the tourist development um, tax to help fund their expansion to their museum. At the time, that expansion was a $37 million um, uh, expansion. They requested and the board approved funding in the amount of $17.5 million. Shortly after that, uh, funding was approved, uh, the pandemic hit, everything changed, including their uh, project. Um, since that time, the project has uh, increased in scope, uh, it's increased in price, um, and they have the, the new cost of the project uh, is, is revised to be $68 million. So last year they came forward and had a new uh, revised request uh, in the amount of $34 million, which would be about 50% of the uh, revised project. At that time, the county engaged with Crossroads Consulting to review the, the data uh, and e economic impact numbers that they provided um, for, with that uh, expanded project. And Crossroads provided three uh, different methodologies that could be used considered um, to justify capital uh, investment in the project from the county. Those three um, methodologies, the first one was to apply the percentage of incremental TDT generation uh, from the museum expansion to the estimated base TD TDT collection um, of the base museum operations without the expansion. The second methodology would be to apply the average percentage of capital grant dollars awarded to similar capital projects um, to the estimated new development cost of $68 million. And the third and final methodology that was 
provided was to apply the percentage change of the estimated TDT revenues to be generated over a 10-year period to the original request and approved capital grant amount of $17.5 million. So once we looked at those, um, we recommended uh, going forward with the first methodology, which was the incremental TDT generated uh, by the expansion over the base um, museum operations. That equated to 37% incremental um, TDT collection. When you apply the 37% to the total to the um, total cost of the project, you get 25.16 million dollars. That's what staffs recommended. In May, um, the DALI uh, requested, presented, and requested um, to the TDC um, funding a uh, funding request in the amount of thirty-four million dollars. The TDC recommended funding the full $34 million ask. Um, we're here today before you um, with staff, staff recommendation and also the TD, TDC recommendation. The second um, part of this request that I want to make sure uh, everyone's aware of because uh, I probably should have included it in the uh, recommended action portion. It's in the staff report, but I want to make sure I highlight it because it's atypical of how we would typically fund these projects, but it's a very important um, uh, part of the, the request from the DALI is so typically when we would fund these projects we would pay the grant funding out at the at the completion of construction and what the DALI is requesting is that when we do the agreement we will pay these out uh, on a quarterly basis throughout um, construction so I did want to highlight that uh, to make sure you are aware it's essentially two asks here happy to answer any questions that you've got Commissioner Latala. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Brian. Um, this is unrelated to the Dolly, um, and my concerns about this project are unrelated to the Dolly because I think they do bring tourism uh, to Pinellas, and that I think is without argument. Uh, but is there any update on beach nourishment? So, Commissioners, we have under contract a firm that is assisting us with kind of getting a policy analysis at the core level about where we're at. But that is early on. We just um, entered into that, I think, a week ago. <clears throat> that's going to give us an, that's a small contract to give us an initial look. These are, the, this firm specializes, they're all former core um, employees, high level core employees. So, we'll have a better explanation for you going forward. I will brief you, not this time, but in two weeks, on a model that we're using because obviously your concern is the, the amount of projects that we have outstanding, yeah. potential projects, and whether we can afford to go forward with projects like this. And the answer really goes down to the, what the core kind of drew a line in the sand, literally, and saying that if you get hit with her, a hurricane, they won't restore your beach. If, if you don't have all the easements. It's, it's really that risk issue that's most important. You do have sufficient funds. We, we'll go through that analysis. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that, and we're trying to refine it. The, the issue is some of that stuff's gonna take time to play out, and we're really looking at a, at a horizon of 40 years um, on, on a lot of these plans. So we, we do have funding. Uh, available and we have sufficient reserves to be able to approve projects like this while we're trying to figure the long-term um, issue out. I know you have a couple of big ticket items that are going to be coming forward, but we'd like to be able to brief you on that. But we really need that policy analysis um, before we can really kind of pull it all together. Um, but I don't believe it should hold up moving forward with, with some of these projects. Well, and thank you for that, Barry. My concern is that with the other big ticket items that we have on the docket coming down the pike, we haven't um, <coughs> considered those yet. And without really getting into it, we have a big ticket item that's gonna be right down the street from the dolly. Um, and that is gonna be substantial. Um, and if those folks can get around to quit talking to Tampa, then maybe, um, you know, we can consider that um, but we'll also have a spring training project perhaps in Clearwater um, that's not going to be near I, I don't imagine near what um, the stadium in St. Pete will be um, but there's going to be you know beach nourishment that I think is going to be a very big ticket item and you can't 
argue that with tourism as the number one economic driver in Pinellas County, that the beaches are first and foremost. And that if we don't have a pristine beach, we're not going to have the tourism. Um, and so, you know, I think that, you know, if we, uh, d you know, my, my preference is that we wait and we wait to see what um, this firm, you know, does about uh, beach nourishment and what the core does and, and, and we bring this back and, and maybe fund it at the 35 million level. Um, if we don't wait, my uh, proposal today and my motion today, uh, when the time comes, will be to uh, fund them at the 17.5 million level, which is what the commission in 2019 um, approved. And the only reason uh, that that wasn't given to them um, was because of the pandemic. Um, you know, the Dolly certainly does good work. I think they bring more tourists than the stadium down the street uh, brings to uh, not just St. Petersburg, but to Pinellas County. Um, but, uh, you know, we certainly have other big uh, concerns that we have to consider. Duly noted, Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so to be clear, so the $17.5 million is still available, right? I mean, that's been approved, but it just hasn't been consumed at this point, right? Correct. After the board uh, <coughs> approved that up to amount of $17.5 million, typically what would occur after that is um, the CVB and the county attorney's office, we do an agreement uh, for that funding that includes all the marketing uh, funding in there um, and uh, all the logistics of it. That was never put in place. Okay. Um, so it was approved. We just didn't do that. The, the, right. the funding's still there. Okay. All right. Okay. So. So what staff's recommending is basically then an additional seven million six hundred sixty thousand at this point, if I did the math directly. Cor correct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, and I, you know, Dolly is is we're lucky to have it. It's 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 a great it's a great museum, and and they do great work down there. I have I have similar concerns to Commissioner Latvella. We've got a lot of other big ticket items that we haven't um, we don't really know what what that's going to be. So um, I, I certainly am, am supportive of the money that was already already approved but I'm a little hesitant to, to really dive in any any deeper on it at, at, at this point so. Commissioner Flowers thank you madam chair thank you Brian for your presentation and I see we have some Dali representatives here in the audience Mr. Hines and Miss Helen Levine it's good to see you <laughs> we had a chance to work together through the city which is how I first met her but um, I'm going to support the original ask, um, the recommendation by staff, and here's why. Um, the cost for the construction of this project, whether it was the initial project, which added all of those additional parking spaces closer to the road versus what it is now, that cost is only going to continue to climb. It's not going to decrease based on where we are right now, based on um, the ability to get supplies in based on the ability to get employees in to actually do the construction. So I don't see that cost decreasing at all. Um, I think all of us remember the meeting that we went to out on the beaches when this project was presented, when the TDC presented this project um, for consideration um, at that time. And, and I do agree, we have some big ticket items coming. I'm not sure what the Phillies hold up is. I've met with the interim mayor of Clearwater and asked a couple of times, where are we with, the, with that? Um, uh, I've asked Barry a couple of times because this has gone on. So I'm not even thinking about them right now until they provide some paper. Where, did I say the wrong name? No, no Commissioner. Um, oh, y'all laughing and giggling, I, so I thought I said the wrong name. We, we've been waiting also. Okay, um, I'm, However, I'm, I am meeting with the city's consultant in a week. Okay, well, that's in a week, but still, I've been here since 2020, and we still don't have anything. So it comes when it comes, and I'll deal with that when it comes. As far as the raise is concerned, I've had my one-on-one -on -one conversations with Barry. I've had conversations with the raise. I got another meeting coming up. You know my feeling and my sense on that. Um, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. We, the, this commission doesn't have anything to do with the uh, the eighty-one plus acre piece of it for the home development and the business um, component. We're only on the stadium piece. So um, 
I'm going to support what has been presented before us because we're asking them to wait. We ask them to wait. The cost is going to continue to go up. If you notice, the cost got, went up from 2019, and it wasn't just only because they uh, redesigned their plan. It is because the cost of materials and supplies will continue to rise. And so we may want to give them 34 at that time or 35, but the price may double at that time. We don't know that. So um, I'm going to support what was presented to us by staff for the recommendation for um, the DALI. And then the others, we will take them as they come. I will say um, that uh, um, it, it is something that the county typically doesn't do, and I'm, I'm not sure why. And paying on draws, um, and that's what I call it, paying on draws, as you move throughout the project because you need to be able to um, – meet those financial demands of whomever the contractor or developer is to make sure that the project gets completed. Um, and then that's also an incentive for them to, um, if they can, push the envelope and finish it ahead of schedule so that it saves a little bit of money down the road. But I'm going to support the um, the initial ask. And I, I read all of the emails and things that we received from community people, the arts community, um, certainly from the board of uh, the Dali, um, but I think it is a, a wonderful attribute. And I've, um, as an aside, I've met with the mayors from the beaches. Um, I've gone out and driven. Um, I've had a number of conversations, and it is very disappointing that we cannot get the support. But we're not the only ones that can't get the support um, when it comes to um, uh, asking for easements or demanding that we have all of the easements before the the Army Corps of Engineers will do anything. We were just at NACO, and thank you to uh, Commissioner Kathleen Peters and Commissioner Brian Scott. I know Commissioner Peters was talking about it with everybody. She came to um, one of our general meetings, and there was consensus around the room that that is an issue all over. So that I don't believe that's going to be resolved anytime soon. And um, um, I think that we're doing it the smart way um, by trying to um, have those conversations with those persons where the easements are being required and what we can do for the longevity of our tourism as it relates to the beaches. But I'm going to support the recommendation um, um, to fund them by staff, the staff's recommendation to fund them. We have it. We need to do it and keep it moving. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. So when we went through the three different potential paths of how to get to, and before we get to that, the, we talked about the 17 million. I got a lot of emails about you gave them 17, you awarded $17 million and you never gave it to them um, like we were holding it back as a penalty or not doing our, and I, I wrote back to everyone who uh, wrote me about okay. explaining the process, the three-step process that you went through. And the $17 million is not really sitting anywhere earmarked for them. It's right. just part of our overall capital reserve, which I think we've got uh, $78 million non-beach uh, in our reserves right now for capital projects. Um, but when we factor in the 25 or 25.16, and I think the, one, of the, one of the analysis set up to 26 point something million dollars um, potential, did we factor, does that include so when we, if we approve this at whatever dollar amount today, it goes back to our staff and they negotiate with the applicant. And we talk about uh, marketing benefits, we talk about use of the facility, um, all those kind of things that gets us to a final number of what the value is of the project and what the value add of the county contribution should be. Um, so have all those factors been <coughs> added in to get us to that 26 or 25.16 number? Because what it, I'll ask you the, the question is one of the things I read was that the um, applicant had committed to spend two million dollars uh, in marketing dollars of their own every year um, for advertising the, the museum and the destination. Does that factor into our benefit at all? And it's okay if you yes. don't. Yes, yes. And marketing was considered uh, throughout the valuation. Um, they showed what they what they would do in marketing, and our um, contract uh, firm they they do a POV uh, from their perspective on what those benefits are and put a price tag on those, and those are considered in here now. Exactly what that looks like in the final agreement uh, and how that marketing plays out is not considered, um, but that's where it'll get ironed out in the final agreement. Well, that's why, I, and today is a, 
and correct me if I'm wrong, today is an up to amount, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's not, what would the anticipation of turnaround time, uh, if we approved it at X dollars today, and you go to the dolly and you all work out together, how long does that process take if everything went smoothly to come back to us for a final approval? I can't give you an educated guess there. This would be the first one I'd be involved in. <laughs> <laughs> He's sorry. been on I'm this sorry. job for only a few months. <laughs> well, my point is that I, I share the con concern everyone has about the, the sand. Everyone's, you know, we started talking about sand and Kelly showed up. So, um, <laughs> but, so I share that. But I also recognize that the dolly's been moving forward in this process, you know, on a, on the timeline uh, prescribed, and um, so I really don't have any problem doing it up to the original 34 today that the TDC approved, knowing that if tomorrow we heard devastating news on sand, then the world is different tomorrow than it is today um, as we move forward. So um, the dolly is a unique attraction. Um, it's different than anywhere else we got. Everyone talks about this big ass down the road. I, I assume that's the St. Pete Museum of History they're talking about. Um, <laughs> and I don't think it's going to be that big, but it, it will be su substantial. So anyway, um, all those factors considered, knowing today is not the final, to, to put us at a parameter of 25 or 17 today, I think limits us in what potentially could be a really good partnership for, uh, for the county and for the museum. So that's kind of where I'm at right now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Peters? Uh, yeah, I, um, I just have a couple comments. I really want to echo most of what Charlie said. I think since we made a commitment in the beginning at $17 million, um, and inflation has shown on every project that we have approved over the last several years since COVID that we have had to increase the price. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I understand the Beach Nourishment, and I've spoken to some of the folks in the audience, and they also agree that beaches are absolutely number one and critical to this county. That said, um, what I would, um, and you know, there's no question that Dolly probably is one of the very best museums in this country, in my opinion. It's an amazing museum, and it does bring people here. Um, and I, I, it's just not arguable. I think, I think they're, they have an amazing, um, place in this county and it really pays a big role but um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm I my issue is the beaches big issue I strongly support the staff recommendation of 25 my concern about going with 34 and then having a beach thing and then have to take it back concerns me because if you make a promise you make a promise and you don't take it back and I maybe I misunderstood you and if I did I apologize um, and so that would be my concern about making a notion of the 34 and then wanting to, this notion that we could take it back. Um, I like the concept of uh, paying quarterly. And I think that helps the museum and that they don't have to come up with the money up front um, and then have to reimburse themselves through a loan or whatever it is that you have to wait to the end. So I, I like the concept of that second part that you brought up uh, with paying the quarterly. So my proposal, and, and I'm, this isn't getting you where you want to go, I'm sorry, but my proposal is that we go with the staff recommendation with a caveat that they could come back for the balance at a later time once we have the beach renourishment issues addressed. Um, I'm, is, that's kind of my thought and my recommendation, that we, um, we go with the 25, we go with the quarterly to help them with that so they don't have to borrow extra money, and that, um, we give them an opportunity to come back once we have the beach renourishment issues solved, um, and then we can address that second portion after. And so that would be my recommendation. Um, uh, and I don't know if you want to have a discussion on that, but um, I, I'd even actually go to make a motion on that one to allow staff recommendation, recommendations on both pieces with the caveat that we could come, they could come back for the balance at a later time. I will second that motion for the purposes of discussion so we can continue to discuss okay. your you. motion. And thank you, Brian, and thank you, Commissioner Peters, and everyone else who's already spoken. Before we go any further, I would like to have uh, Hank Hine please come forward and tell me, please, and my colleagues, is this a problem if we delay the vote today to take it up after we have some of these other issues tied down. I'm just asking for the sake of clarity. 
Thank you. Let me process that question uh, while I, I thank the commissioners for bringing this forward, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. <coughs> um, time has been uh, a, 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 an aggravant to all of us in trying to recover from COVID. Uh, the Dali Museum is trying to regain its, its foothold. <clears throat> Pre uh, before COVID, we, we would bring in between 400 and 450,000 people a year. Uh, you're driving 155, 175 million dollars of direct spending in the community. Uh, those numbers have dipped down into the 300,000s. And part of our revamping of our request was to create uh, new assets that would appeal to a broader demographic, that would appeal to uh, younger people and people who are not uh, um, accustomed, accustomed to going to art museums. So we've, we have uh, adjusted to that because of, of um, the problems of the pandemic and cultural shifts, economic shifts in this country. Um, so time has seemed to be um, uh, absolutely deleterious to everybody's ability to gain their foothold in this, in this recovery period. Uh, I don't know how much longer we can sustain the interest of our immediate community because when we ask you for 34 million, we're talking about raising 34 million ourselves, uh, 17 and a half of which we had ready before the pandemic, but we have a strategy to raise that other but without your full funding, it's unlikely that we would be able to accomplish the same project. So um, uh, I know each of you is familiar with the Dolly Museum. Uh, I appreciate so much um, each one of you either receiving me in your office or coming down to the Dolly. Most of you came down. Four of you were here <clears throat> in uh, 2019 when there was unanimous approval here. Um, we were really gratified um, when we came before uh, Chairman Long as chair of the TDC uh, and those members of the TDC who are really on uh, the front line of protecting what is the major industry in Pinellas County, tourism, uh, voted unanimously to approve the full funding, demonstrating that they understand how powerful the Dolly is uh, to bringing visitors and sustaining uh, with tax dollars this community. Um, and I understand uh, Mr. Burton's logic uh, in speaking about incremental uh, increases uh, based on uh, various, uh, various analyses, but we really need the full funding of the project uh, to create the full project uh, so that we can continue to uh, drive to Pinellas and make Pinellas and the Dolly the first choice uh, of visitors. So uh, I'm sorry not to give more clarity on your answer. It, it's uncertain. We have a plan in hand, and I, I would remind this, this commission that there will always be uh, projects coming. When there's, as sure as death and taxes, when there's uh, a grants to be had, there will be <laughs> applicants for those grants. Uh, we are uh, and have been for two years ready. Uh, we brought to the TDC two years uh, to the last director of, of the TDC this proposal. It took us a year to get onto their agenda. Then it took six months to come before the uh, TDC again for an action. Uh, all this is, is going on, but, but we are the bird in hand. Uh, we're the proven uh, cultural driver in the area. Uh, we are filling the coffers, um, something like paying back, uh, as, as uh, my colleague uh, Tim Bogot will, will hopefully be able to tell you, paying back the coffers almost as though this is a loan in, in about 15 years with what we anticipate and what the, uh, the county's consultants have affirmed is our productive tourist tax development. Thank you, Mr. Hine. Uh, Tim, you want to come up, please? I, I have a question. Oh, 
Well, I'm, Mr. Hines. Oh, you do? Yeah. Okay. Well, May I'm I so stay sorry. then and I'll answer that question while? Yeah. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, Mr. Hine. Thank um, you. I was prepared to not support anything above 17.5. Uh, a couple of my colleagues expressed, or several of my colleagues expressed support for uh, the $25 million staff recommendation, but it made it seem, based on your testimony, that y'all needed the full $34 million uh, request. Uh, so my question is, can you make do with the $25 million? So we have a, a $68 million project. Uh, we were looking to raise 34 from our side. Uh, so you're asking now, can we, instead of raising 34 million, providing from the Dolly's resources and the community, can we come up with uh, an additional uh, 25 million? I don't know. No, I don't know no it would be 8.8. Eight eight well, 8.8. 8. 8. 8. Difference. From 25 to 34. Well, yep. from from 34, 34 to 25, to, but we're not talking about yeah. half the project. We're talking about 68 million. Yeah, so we have to come up with that full 34 million less. <coughs> in, in addition, the negative that's not coming from the county if it were a 25 million dollar grant. Plus, we would have to come up with any cost overruns that we almost expect. <coughs> and to that point, I would just like to throw in here for clarification. As someone who has had a, a past making their career and living from raising dollars, I totally understand the importance of being able to go to your donor list and share with them that you have the dollars to match your refunding request. So just so everyone knows, I am going to be supporting your request. Commissioner Lando. Uh, no, I was just pointing at Commissioner Scott. <laughs> I tried to do yeah, this. Yeah, you finished though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I got it. Don't worry. I'm on <laughs> Commissioner Scott. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and thank you for both, both for, for being here. So uh, based on what you know we've talked about here, I'm 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 inclined to support staff recommendation in, of twenty five point one because of inflation and and uh, some of the comments that have been made here. Um, I guess my question is is that it, it was a thirty four million dollar project and, and then it expanded, which was it it was a, a it was a forty million dollar project for which the commission approved seventeen and a half million. Okay, so it was forty million dollar project. So, so that it's now a sixty eight million dollar project. That's not just all inflation, right? The project was expanded. Yes, uh, dramatically. We have the, those <coughs> figures uh, that we've shared of how it increased over time. So, in in twenty nineteen, between twenty nineteen and uh, twenty twenty one. There was an inflation in the project going from the 40 million to 50 uh, to 50 million. Okay. So, so then, 10 million dollar inflation. Yeah, and okay. then the increase in scope between 2021 and 2023, plus the increase in inflation, brought it to 68. So it's a combination of increased scope mm -hmm. and inflation. So I, I guess my question is: Does it, does it have to be a 68 million dollar project? Uh, as conceived, it's a $68 million project. And, and of course, trying to look at all contingencies, we've asked our builders, what if we cut this down? And they right. said, as, as I'm sure you're familiar as business people, they said, your, your, your three quarters of your cost is in doing the site preparation. You're, you're not going to be able to create, for instance, with, a, a, let's just say, half the project. You're not going to be able to do half the project with half the money. And you can't do three quarters of the project with three quarters of the money. You, so, so what do we take out? Do we take out the education part? Not good for the community. Do we take out the places for the interactive technologies? Not good for driving visitors. So we're, we're kind of in a difficult place where this is the project that we think will best serve the community and drive the most tax bases. Otherwise, it's a de minimis argument. We can keep reducing things, and the, the success of it is reduced probably in, in, as a square function rather than linearly. So I think what we'd like to propose is that if 
there isn't a willingness to approve the full 34 million that we would be willing to say then if the b building doesn't cost the full 68 million that the credit would go to the county <clears throat> so we're going to look just so everybody is aware of the urgency here we're going to lose one of our commissioners if we don't move this along yes and i'm just asking for the sake of project are we in a posture to vote or do you want to keep on talking I just have one question that will help me vote. I haven't spoken so I'd like to speak at some point before oh. mm -mm. go to the Commissioner Eggers um, yeah guys thank you for being here for all you do for our community um, and I guess the I just the, the, obligat the, the obligatory you know this isn't about what you do for the community or not you guys do amazing things so thank you for all of that and I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the message that we're sending, not only for, you know, Rays, Clearwater Phillies, and you all, if we don't get this beach thing resolved. And I, don't, I really don't know what that means. And, and so um, some of the things that have been said today, I'm, I'm you know, because I, I came here saying we ought to hold, wait, until we get this thing figured out. And I think it sends a signal to our residents, to everybody, that we've got to get this done first and foremost. Um, Commissioner Peters made a comment about promises made. So we made a promise for 17 and a half million. Um, and to me, that's what I can support today. Uh, but I certainly made a comment about coming back and asking for additional funds once we get this thing figured out. Uh, that, that, that I'll support. The question I have, what is your intention on, on, on your piece in terms of equity versus debt funding? Uh, I'd have to go through the charts on that. We. Uh, as I mentioned, we have the 17 and a half million ready, uh, and we'll draw on uh, parts, <coughs> other parts of it, uh, in, in terms of community, that is the immediate family around the Dali uh, support. Uh, then we'll look for corporate sponsorship for another fraction of it. Okay. So most of it will be, it sounds like most of it in the end will be equity based and not, not a loan. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate everything, guys. Commissioner Justice. Thank you. Just, there's been a lot of talk about the, the cost of changes and things, but it is a very significant, it's, it's, you have to kind of throw out the old project. It's really not the same project anymore. That was like one level of a parking garage expansion. This is an entire new addition. Um, this, I, I kind of see that we've, a few years ago, they were asking for a, a Chevy or Buick addition, and this is a Cadillac, and I don't mean that in cost, I mean that in quality of the project changed from what it was to what it is now. It's completely different. Um, so that, that's why I, I, and I and I don't see it as a, uh, I don't see it as a, if we did 34, you're getting 34, you're walking out with a check 34 today. They understand that. It's a negotiation of um, what the costs are, what the benefit is, what all the marketing agreements would be. Um, uh, so, but Madam Chair, for your uh, request for brevity, that I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Are we in a posture to move forward, members? Madam, Madam Chair, uh, given a, an obvious difficult situation here, uh, I would certainly uh, accept as a, a, a very positive motion uh, the one that uh, uh, the Vice Chair has, has suggested that there be allocated the staff recommendation uh, with the stipulation that we may come back uh, with a determined time following the uh, solving of the beach renourishment uh, <coughs> to go for the rest of, uh, to ask you for the rest of the 34 million. And did everybody receive the uh, forecast and the letter that I sent? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Uh, th I would just ask you to be sure that you're not overlooking the fact that this is really an engine uh, that produces tax. Got it. Returned hmm. back to the county. More so, I think, having been on the Tourist Development Council, more so than any other project I've ever seen. It produces tax coming back to the county that can be used for beach renourishment, used Duly for the raise, noted. whatever. Duly noted. Thank you. Yep. We have the motion. Okay. We have the motion and we have a second. Is the clerk clear? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, let's prepare to vote, please. Could, could you read that motion? So we can. The motion was by um, Vice Chair Peters for the um, approval of the amount of $25 million and then be paid out quarterly with the caveat that um, you come back after be beach renourishment is resolved for the additional amount, which will be $8.84 million. And would you be willing to change that, Commissioner Peters, to okay. simply say that the credit, if it costs less than the $68 hold on, million, hold would on, come hold off? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I, I, at this point, I'm not willing to amend the motion due to time, yeah. because I'm the one that's going to have to leave. Mm -hmm. So I um, we can negotiate this later, but not right now. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we have already started voting. Please take your seats. You. We are moving on to the moment. Out. We're going to walk out. Um, one additional item, commissioners. Um, uh, very. The other Hold on. Go. Care. Yep. He does. Yes. I, I got care. it. Okay. I'm, I'm on. Yeah. Oh, great. Yikes. Around. Okay. We have uh, the motion passes five to two. Two members have abstained. And the clerk has the record? Yes. Correct. Okay. Good. We're good. All right. Moving on, we are going to. Okay. Back to item 13. Commissioners, okay, item 13 is the third amendment to an agreement with Schneider um, Elevator Corporation uh, for elevator maintenance repair. Uh, the breakdown is within your packet. Move approval. Second. Okay, would you please open the board? Okay. Flower 13. Oh, huh? I'm sorry, was that item 13? This is 13. item 13. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, who was the second? Oh. Commissioner Scott? Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Scott. Now we're Senator Eggers. I'm a yes. We're switching. Okay, how do I get this? <laughs> and that motion passes. Item 15 is the East Lake um, Recreation District, and this is an MSTU funding request uh, for $20,000. Move approval. approval. Second. Please open the board. First. Who made the first? Commissioner Eggers. <coughs> and that motion? Yes, I'm a yes. Commissioner Eggers is a yes, and that motion passes. And now we are on number 16. Yeah, this is interlocal agreement between Pinellas County and Pinellas County Schools for disaster shelter facilities and ancillary services. Move approval. Second. Moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Justice. Please open the board. For the and that motion passes. Yes. Okay. Number 17. So not item number 17 is a companion item to item number 18. The first being, uh, this is a ranking of firms for development of residential properties in the Loman community. Um, as you can see, there upon the transfer of the property, then you, you'll have um, agreements uh, for development of the property when, with Habitat for single family affordable units. Can we vote together? We have to vote on these separately. If uh, the motion's to take them together, I, I can. move approval for 17 and 18. Second. It's, it's been moved to take up 17 and 18. Commissioner Flowers made the motion. Commissioner Justice made the second. Please open the board. All right. So we are on 19. And this is a budget amendment um, to allocate uh, American Rescue Plan funds from the mobile home communities portable water system improvements to the mobile home communities wastewater systems as discussed at our work session. Move approval. Second. Moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner by Commissioner Justice. Uh, please open the voting board. And that motion passes. Mm -hmm. 
number 20. Third, this is a third party railroad reimbursement agreement with uh, CSX Railroad and the Florida Department of Transportation for crossing uh, at 46th Avenue. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Scott. Please open the board. <coughs> And that motion passes unanimously. Number 21. This is a First Amendment. Uh, uh, keep Pinellas beautiful for adopt a program management services. Move approval. Second. And moved by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner uh, Flowers. Please open the board voting. And the motion passes unanimously. <laughs> Number 22. This is the Fifth Amendment to an agreement with Sinagro, I don't know which are the name, but this is for our sludge drying project and uh, this is to make improvements to the facility uh, where they do the pelletizing mm -hmm. of the wastewater and these are system improvements um, for OSHA requirements and things like that. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Scott. Please open the voting card. <coughs> Number 23. Uh, this is an interlocal agreement with the town of Bel Air for the sale of wholesale portable water. Uh, we've done over the past couple of years several different analysis working with the town um, on prov providing for portable water. Uh, what they've chosen is to do it on a wholesale basis, so we'll sell water to them. Move approval. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Scott. Please open the card for voting. And it's been unanimously approved. Number number twenty three. Twenty four. It's number twenty four. Sorry. Uh, under item number twenty four, this is a recommendation to authorize the uh, retention of outside counsel for the purposes of filing suit, and also also to authorize filing suit. Uh, against various parties related to uh, the pricing of insulin, as we discussed last week at the uh, agenda review. Madam okay. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Real Flowers. Quick. That was a huge topic at NACO, um, and the presentation room was completely crowded. Um, not necessarily the cost of insulin that the person is paying to the pharmacy, but what we're paying. So I brought this um, back for you if you just want to peruse the uh, information. Sure. And, and I will tell you, I did have um, some information shared that came from the law firm that we would be retaining. Um, several st several states have filed suit um, against some of the, the defendants we'd be talking about. There are some uh, class actions pending various places, uh, some for from persons directly affected by this, uh, some by some drug distributors. So again, these are not new lawsuits, would certainly be new to Pinellas County. Did you have a question, Commissioner I, Scott? I did. Um, do, do we know, um, and if, if this is better one-on-one, -on -one, just, just say so, but do we have an, ex, an expectation of what a result might be or how much um, economic damage the county has, has suffered because of this? When, well, I will tell you, um, we did get a public records request subsequent to the um, agenda review last week, <coughs> and what we sent out was, was an estimate of what could be potential damages um, that was pulled together primarily by your human resources department that was in the eight to nine hundred thousand dollar range okay. it's really hard to predict sure. you know what you would recover um, during any kind of litigation but that was an estimate uh, pretty, pretty done pretty quickly I will say a pretty quick estimate of potential damages that the county could could allege right okay mm. thank you and would you my question to you, Jewel, is would you anticipate that the state will swoop in like they did on the opioid litigation and take, money, are, take our money? We are not anticipating that. 
Um, I think we would have potentially seen movement in that, that regard thus far. Um, you know, we did talk a little bit last week. One of the things I do find different between the opioid lawsuit, which you all are very, very, very aware of, um, and this lawsuit is really, um, you know, I don't want to kind of say one's, you know, a better lawsuit over the other, but I think these are more direct damages that we can show on paper. This is what we spent. This is what the cost, according to Congress and some other sources, should have been. Um, you know, whereas before we were trying to, you know, come up with the cost for treatment and law enforcement and, you know, just a lot of other miscellaneous costs. And I know that we've been joined by Ms. Pemberton on my staff who might be able to answer better. I, that's a long way to answer your question. We're not anticipating it, but again, with litigation, we're never going to give you a 100% certainty on anything. Well, I am a little uh, encouraged by seeing our illustrious Christy Pemberton sitting here. Do you have anything to add, madam? I apologize, Christy Pemberton, County Attorney's Office, you started moving very fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, our, um, the outside counsel that we are proposing to you, they have tracked this, they've already filed um, some litigation on this, and the numbers are quite startling. Like, for example, between 1997 and 2018, one form of insulin, Humalog, increased 1,527% in cost. Mm -hmm. Yikes. So, the, you know, this is hard data, and we do understand it's not going to be much work for county staff, that we just need to give our contracts um, to outside counsel, and they will do the rest. Mm -hmm. Do you know if we will be using the same group of attorneys that we did for the opioid? It's largely the same, Christy. And Christy might be able to say if there's like one or two that's that's different, but it is our local contact here is certainly the same. Um, we did have a local firm, local up in Pasco, um, and then some of the firms, I know the one out of the panhandle is going to be the same, but Christy might be able to eliminate. Yes, the Levin firm would still be the main consortium firm, and Jim Magazine would still be our local counsel. Uh, the other members of the consortium are different uh, because this is the area that they focus on versus the opioids. So they are going to be more subject matter experts. Perfect. Thank you so much. And again, the recommendation is to approve the contract with outside counsel and authorize the litigation. Got it. Uh, I'll move approval on both of those items. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, may, I, may we have the card for voting, please? Thank you. <coughs> Very well done, as usual. <coughs> and that motion passes. Okay. I have no reports. Mr. Barry. Commissioners, I have two items this morning. Uh, first is we did provide last week a presentation, Kelly and I, to the Big C uh, concerning beach nourishment. Um, you know, obviously this is a big topic and I kind of covered it in general terms, but, but I don't think it's something that's going to be solved easily or quickly. Um, you know, as we've seen, they, they're, they're kind of digging their heels in literally. Um, and so we're going to have to work on this. We'll have a better idea once this firm kind of does an initial assessment of the issues, kind of course position and things like that. Um, but we also know that we're going to have to act soon on some of these areas where we're, we're really at risk, um, you know, with 10 foot drop offs and things like that. So there's going to be some interim plans that we're working on that we're going to bring back to you. We do have healthy reserves, as you know, and that's a good thing because we're, we're able to act on these. Um, but there's going to be a lot more to come, but it's going to take time. And um, I don't think it's going to be an easy fix. What we are also preparing, though, is as we shared with you at the work session kind of the best case and worst case scenarios we've we've employed an outside financial firm to assist us in kind of creating um, um, models that we can use and we can plug and play dependent upon you know, the assumptions that you use in that including the amount that you put on the capital or operating and how that impacts your model right now over the next several years we're fine and we have sufficient reserves to do that it's when it's from a policy standpoint kind of the going it alone what happens 20 30 years from now that's where you see you know issues so um in two weeks when we do our one-on-ones i'm going to go through that model with you and and we'll kind of show you some of the assumptions but hopefully by that time we'll have an initial um, report back from that firm on trying to give us a, a better idea of kind of uh, where we should go 
with this concerning the core. That initial assessment will also help us to create this statewide coalition um, that we've been pulling together because we're kind of the first in because our projects are further along. Um, but 11 or 10 other uh, counties and one city received the same letter we received. Um, and so we're, we're, we're working with Florida Association of Counties on creating that coalition. And as you know, Commissioner Flowers said, Commissioner Peters and, and Commissioner Scott, trying to bring that in, even making that a NACO issue. So that's kind of where we're at on that and kind of the update. So I have a uh, question. Um, Commissioner well, Lavallo. Thank you. Um, along those uh, lines, and it goes back to something that we talked about um, at the work session, I believe it was Commissioner Peters brought it up. Um, and it seemed that the Corps was not following their own policy in some areas. Um, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, uh, but I, you know, know some. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really? Ha have, has there been any further discussions um, with the coalition of the uh, counties that you mentioned or with FAC <clears throat> about possible uh, litigation against the core or the administration? I don't think we're taking anything off the table at this point, but I don't think we know enough to be able to. I think that's the reason we employed a group like that, that, that has the expertise to really tell us what our options are. And, and so I think we're looking for that advice and bringing back to you and to the other counties um, recommendations regarding strategy. I think, you know, we've, we've went down several different strategies thus far without <coughs> success. Um, we're trying to step back, get all the information in and help bring back specific recommendations on what the, that next step should be. Madam Chair, if I can respond to his, yeah, just uh, Commissioner Lotvalos. Give me, give me one second to keep in mind that our policy and our legislative conference are coming right up on the horizon. This will be a great topic mm -hmm. to bring to them. Commissioner Flowers and then you. Thank you. That was one of the things I was going to say at our innovation um, and legislative policy that's coming up. Um, that will be one of the discussions that's on the table. Um, we have some counties in Florida that have received the benefit of um, the Army Corps of Engineers assisting them, and then we have others like us who we've not received the benefit, and as a matter of fact, they seem to now be really um, not being really nice to us at all. And so um, we have, a, when I say we, I mean the executive level of fact hasn't um, determined if um, there would be any type of legal um, actions um, taken, but I'm sure that conversation will be, and we would love to have your, your voice. Not only do I know lawyers, I happen to also know the second vice president of FAP. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, know that, and know that the second vice president is certainly pushing that we look at this, because it's an issue all over the state. But I just wanted to share with you, we did talk about that. Commissioner Peters did come to, um, at, even at NACO, on the NACO level, she came to the um, breakfast that we were having. And, um, and when we kind of put it out there, it was a head nod, but not an official vote. Um, but it was kind of a head nod at, okay, this will be the next step because we've tried all the other steps and it's just not working. Um, and then what are we going to do if we get one, if one hits us? And then as a result of not having that protection. Correct. So. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Eggers. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's strange. I'm not, I'm, you know, sometimes when we go through this conversation, I start to lose track of what the real issue is because it seems like we had a concurrence from the Army Corps of Engineer Jacksonville office um, to what we were asking. It wasn't like we went to another county and got their opinion or another expert or consultant. We went to the Army Corps. So they've changed at the, at the national level a policy mm -hmm. right. it has nothing to do with what they've been supporting for years that's correct correct so what's the argument that we bring forward what what do we what do we go after well, if it's not whether it's the good thing to do because obviously it has been and they concurred so in my mind in subject to change with the people that really know this issue um, there, there's really two issues um, one is there's a different interpretation of national policy, okay? and that 
has financial implications, but it, but it has far greater implications by stating that if they don't have the easements, they can't come in and restore your beach in the case of a disaster. That, that I mean, it's, it's costly enough, kind of a do-it-yourself do it strategy, but that risk just really up, up the ante. Okay, and then there's the natural policy, which is they're interpreting, um, it's a, get, a matter of policy interpretation, not a matter of law, of how they're applying that, and that you have to have these easements, even though you're not putting sand, you know, in that area, and they have to be perpetual. So it's, it's those two issues. The, the consultant that we hired is, they're all former Corps, you know, Army Corps people, high up type people. Um, they're trying to assess that right now. They're like, this doesn't make sense. Um, and so I think that having that, they'll have direct conversations with even higher level people, my, my estimate. Um, and so we'll have a better idea from them of that assessment. I think having that outside fresh look um, without, we'll, we'll give it a lot more that we haven't had up to this point and trying to get some insight as to what, why this change in interpretation of policy um, and it will help us design a strategy about how to resolve it. So, the, so they really don't, I mean, if, if, I think we're all in agreement that if they were replacing sand in the easement, uh, in the pr private property, that would be a different, different right. thing, right? Yes. The easements then would make sense. If we wait long enough and we lose enough sand, what's going to happen? It's going to reach those areas. And that's what doesn't make sense because it's not like they're just picking on us. They've applied this, you know, throughout. And, and so that's what's, we're literally just on the cusp of seeing the impact, the far-reaching impact this has. Yeah. Even to the point of, down on Treasure Island where this nourishment, they weren't going to put sand on one particular area. They haven't nourished it since the 60s, and they said unless you have easements in that area, the entire they stopped the project, mm -hmm. even though they're not going to even touch it, and you haven't nourished it since the 60s. So th this is, it's, it's mind-numbing. It, uh, it is, and it, the, I think it's important to remember that those decisions were made by attorneys in D.C., not policymakers, number one. And number two, if it, I know Commissioner Flowers, I think, was there at the Regional Planning Council summit yes. when that world national geologist spoke mm -hmm. about the changing, um, the changing boundaries of the, the whole United States along the coast and how th and this is exactly what he said. If you're thinking of your boundaries, the way they are today, and that you can keep on keeping them that way for the next 25, 30, 40, or 50 years, you are living with your head in the sand. And that was a very powerful statement to me because it said to me that, you know, you cannot mess with Mother Nature without causing unintended consequences, and this is just the way the world changes as time goes on and different weather cycles come along it has a big impact and look for those people that don't want to sign the easements shame on them because that beach is the first defense correct in the wake of an oncoming threat or storm so they're putting their own property and lives at risk by being that stubborn on an issue they don't clearly thoroughly understand so yeah that's, it's a that's the bottom line. They the destruction of communities all over this country, really. It the, is, the, the but it's not just our country. It's everywhere in the world. Commissioner Latvala. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, have we reached out, has the county reached out to Duke to try to get them involved in, in helping us? Because they have some infrastructure, from my understanding, uh, up and down the beach that's buried, that if there was a flood would, would be impacted. I don't think we have. We certainly can't. Which would can. be very costly to them, but also uh, would be a safety uh, issue as well. We certainly will. And it takes out communication and right. a lot of infrastructure right. that we currently have there. 
but look no further than what's going on down at Ian. And what are they do where you know where Hurricane Ian was and what are we doing? We're rebuilding it. When if you had any common sense, you'd think about declaring the land with eminent domain and making a public park out of it cuz you think this isn't going to happen again? It's just nuts to me, but I'm not going to get on my soapbox. You all know where that goes. So that's the first part of my report. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the second part is uh, Coming, getting, start thinking about the next joint Pasco, Hillsboro, and Pinellas joint meeting. Yeah. Um, we have it tentatively scheduled for October the 15th. I did meet with my counterparts, um, and what we're going to uh, propose this time is that uh, Hill, we kind of found the dead center middle last time at the airport. I think that was a good location, but then we're going to have the next one. We'll have Hillsboro host, and then we're going to host, and then Pasco will host. Or the we next already had it in Hillsboro. Well, that was now <laughs> we want to do the port. They want to do the port, and there was a lot of interest from lots of people around that. And then when we host it, maybe we'll host it at Tampa Bay Water, you, um, you, you know, that. or or something like that. So anyway, be thinking about topics. I'll have a um, we worked out kind of a list of uh, topics. I'll be doing that. I'll be bringing that to our one on ones, getting your input on that. But we have. We have a little bit of time, but we're starting to plan right now. So. so to that point, Mr. Administrator, Commissioner Eggers has a question he would like to ask, well, I so was, I don't have to. I was being a little snarky <laughs> because the last time we had a planned meeting at the port, mm -hmm. Hillsborough didn't show up. And so, specifically, we had it there so they would so show I'm up. So I'm assuming that... I, I agree with that you. That was I before Barry, so go yeah, ahead. BB? <laughs> 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 so I'm, I, I agree with you. I think the airport was the first one we all kind of got together on. Yes. Because uh, so everybody gonna, loves the We're going to let them do it, uh, but I uh, truly hope they do show this time because Thank it's really important. We will. It's really important. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Mike. That concludes my report. Okay. And now we are on to some appointments. First one is Emergency, emergency Medical Services Council, and you have the applicants listed there. Move approval. We have, we, have a, we have a motion and a second. Please open the voting board. Okay. And um, the next one is that passed unanimously. So the next one is WorkNet Pinellas. Move approval of the slate as provided. Second. Okay. Then moved and seconded. And please open the board for voting. All I right. just feel bad for Mr. Meyer sitting here the whole meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, smiling the whole time. Okay, so the next one is County Commission New Business. Commissioner Latvala. Uh, when the TDC votes, they were doing that at the end. We probably need to wait, so don't we? We only have six. What? We only have six. We, we they, they, they resolved it. That's what we had the problem last okay. time. I'm just asking. We ha we haven't we haven't. Okay. Under control. Don't worry. Commissioner Latvala. Thank you. Um, <laughs> congratulations to Clearwater's new chief of police, uh, Eric Gandy, who was sworn <coughs> in yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, he has big shoes to fill, but I have no doubt he will do an incredible job. Um, I sit on a board of one of um, a local foundation, and that is the Lila Goody Foundation. Uh, Lila was um, one of the most incredible people that uh, I have ever known. Uh, she was an amazing 10-year-old uh, who passed away uh, almost a year ago, um, unexpectedly. Uh, she never met a stranger. Uh, she loved her family, friends, and her God. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, her family and friends have set up a foundation in her honor uh, and, and we're hosting a, um, a fundraiser next week, August 9th, uh, from 5 to 7 at the Chick-fil-A in Countryside in 19, uh, which uh, Commissioner Eggers will remind me is in his district. Uh, but if y'all come out, uh, I will be more than happy to buy each one of y'all dinner as part of the proceeds uh, from Chick-fil-A will be going to the Lila Goody Foundation. Um, and uh, her mom has um, 
uh, targeted uh, one of the first uh, proceeds or one of the first things to do with the proceeds uh, that we raise uh, from her foundation will be service uh, dogs uh, at Teppan General Hospital. And what these dogs do is they're trained to go into the beds of sick kids and just lie with them. Um, and when Lila used to stay at uh, hospitals, a lot of times the dogs would just go and, and stay and, and lie in her bed. Um, are, they, are they a specific type of dog, you know? Uh, they are, but but uh, but I I do not know. Uh, but the, but they are trained. Um, they're, good, they're good dogs. Oh no, <laughs> yeah, um, probably Labrador retrievers. You but, guys, uh, but yeah, um, the, they're like a specialty trained uh, dog. Um, <clears throat> uh, so that's next week, uh, August 9th from five to seven at Chick Fil A in Countryside and nineteen. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, it's something that would probably be more fitting to talk about at a JWB meeting, uh, which I sit on. Um, but um, unfortunately, their board meetings oftentimes coincide with our work sessions. Um, and so I have not been able to attend the last uh, two or three months. And that is a local um, nonprofit that we have that uh, I think is not doing a very good job and hopefully they will start doing a better job, and that is Suncoast. Um, I um, that I believe that they have uh, issues that uh, you know, frankly, start from the top um, and and go on down. And and I've talked to six or seven experts in our community, uh, people that are smarter than I am, and to be honest, not a single one of those people have said a good thing about them. Um, and I'm, I'm obviously not going to mention who those people are. Um, things that uh, I've heard about Suncoast include lack of training, lack of oversight, uh, not cooperative with data and outcomes, um, and you know, obviously issues with their executive uh, team. Um, I think uh, you know, perhaps issues with board oversight, uh, and not until recently uh, was there or up until recently, it, their website looked like it was designed by a 12-year-old, you know, somebody in junior high. Commissioner Latnow, um, are you talking about Suncoast Behavioral Health? Yeah, Suncoast Center I, on, on okay. Roosevelt. I, um, I and, and I wanted to bring this up in a government meeting in the sunshine, because uh, obviously I can't talk to any of y'all outside of this meeting, um, and I can't talk to any of the JWB board members outside of one of their meetings, which I have been unable to attend. Um, but hopefully Suncoast will correct um, and, and do better. And one of the things that um, frankly has been most concerning was I had a meeting with their CEO and uh, some of their executive uh, team. And I asked them what kind of focus they had in the minority community when it came to mental health. And the answer that I got back uh, was concerning, and the response was that they had uh, black counselors in South St. Petersburg, which, and I use the term minority community. Um, the, our, our wonderful county has many minority communities, and we certainly have more than one African American community. And, and I think that uh, we have a significant African American community and Tarpon Springs and Clearwater and, and other parts of the county, if you're just talking about the African American community, but we all certainly have other minority communities. Um, and so, you know, I have significant concerns with Suncoast and, and I want them to be aware of that and hopefully um, they will do a better job, not just in suicide prevention, which is what they're known for, but in, in other areas that they serve our county. So thank you very much. Thank you for your report, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Eggers? Yeah, I just had, <laughs> just had two things real quickly. Um, I think uh, the conversation that Barry brought up about um, having our joint meeting in October um, set the table for regional comments, and those were my two comments. Um, so our MPO, um, Forward Pinellas, is undergoing um, a review with other MPOs in the area. Uh, to perhaps create a single 
regional MPO. Um, there's a lot of interest, certainly out of Pasco County, a lot of interest uh, gaining a little bit in Hillsborough County and interest here. And the state is encouraging us to move in that direction. It'll probably take a few years to get there. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to that. We are having a special meeting for our MPO tomorrow, I think, to discuss the apportionment or reapportionment of that, of that board and um, uh, of our board in terms of how many people. Right now we have 13. And so we'll be looking at that as we move forward in trying to have a larger group of input from our county that will feed that regional MPO. So I think it's all going to work well together. Um, and it is certainly uh, something that uh, I think would be benefit our residents primarily and certainly our business community. So that was number one. Number two, Tampa Bay Water is going to be coming here to this commission sometime, September-ish or October. Um, and I have reached out to the general manager to kind of be putting together the, his presentation uh, and kind of tailoring it to each commission because they do things for all of us, but then they also are on doing special projects for each commission. So I'm looking forward to that, and I just suggest you uh, reach out to staff um, if there's anything in particular that you would like them to bring to you. Um, otherwise, it'll be a general, uh, general presentation, maybe with a little bit of a, uh, a bent towards Pinellas County. Um, but if you have anything in particular that you're interested in hearing about uh, Tampa Bay Water, which is just, there's so much going on there, um, that uh, please reach out to, um, to Barry and uh, our utility staff and uh, make sure that we accomplish what you guys want in that short time that we have them here. Thank you. That's all I have. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I had um, a whole list of everything we, that I've done since we last uh, did this round table here, and of course I left it in my office, so um, it's probably better I'll be briefer. <laughs> um, so uh, last week uh, I did attend uh, NACO along with uh, Commissioner Flowers, Justice, and uh, Peters, and um, I thoroughly enjoyed it, um, learned a lot, uh, met a lot of people, and um, I know you'll, you'll all find this shocking, but I was appointed to the uh, Transportation Steering Committee. <laughs> So, um, so stay tuned for more on that. Is that transportation um, as in transit? It encompasses everything. Okay. Yeah, it, it's roads, bridges, transit. It's 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 the whole the whole ball of wax. But, um, last week, I did have an opportunity to uh, tour uh, Avera Health and um, see all of the great things they're doing for our community there. Um, and then last Friday, I did a uh, a tour. Uh, Tampa Bay Watch was uh, um, very nice to host uh, myself and uh, Josh Goebbels, um, who is a Senator Rubio's uh, regional director, and Olivia Carson, who is a representative of Luna's uh, local director here, on a boat tour. And we started um, down at Tierra Verde there and started from Grand Canal and took a tour all the way up to almost uh, Sand Key to view the beach erosion issues uh, firsthand. And I have not seen them from the water that way in quite some time. And there are some areas where it's extremely dramatic. Uh, Pass a Grill, uh, Up and Beach uh, are two that come to mind, where the sand dunes are literally eroded 50%. I mean, they're, they're literally gone. It looks like a 10-foot 10 10 foot cliff. Um, so um, neither uh, Olivia nor uh, uh, Josh had, had seen those before, so it, it definitely made an impact on them, and they have communicated that. I know Representative Luna is very, very familiar with the issue, but they've communicated the, that back uh, to, their, to their bosses. And I want to thank uh, Peter Clark um, with uh, Tampa Bay Watch and also Dwayne uh, Virgin uh, for hosting us on, on that tour. Um, as a result of that, um, Representative Luna has um, offered to um, host a Zoom call for all of us to, to just talk about it. Um, that might be a little problematic with our, our schedules and, and it would probably have to be noticed for Sunshine. So maybe, maybe it'd be something that we would want to maybe invite her to participate via Zoom or in person if she's available in one of our upcoming uh, work sessions. That would be so. great. And that reminds me, Commissioner Scott, that we do have our federal delegation meeting coming up. And since you've had that experience with her, perhaps you might extend a personal invitation to her, see if she can show up. That'd, That'd be great. great, yeah. Okay. That'd yeah, be I'll a do. great place to talk about it and okay. she can make her thoughts known. Mm -hmm. 
and if she's able to come to one of our commission meetings, we would love to have her here. Okay. I will. That wouldn't be an yeah. untoward thing to, to do. Our former congressman was pretty visible with our county commission, so would love to have her. All right. Well, good. I'll, I'll work on that. All right. Commissioner Flowers. He, got, he has oh, more. Oh, I am so sorry. One other. <laughs> I, I thought that was your. Okay. He, he, he has more. said short. Please <laughs> forgive me. You did say brief. <laughs> I have a, a piece of new business on behalf of okay. Commissioner Peters um, who um, would like uh, Ryan Andrews to serve as her appointment to the Feather Sound uh, Community Service District. So this was just handed to me via note. So I'm assuming there's a vacancy. <laughs> I don't know. Is there? Yes. There so moved. There is. So moved. Okay. But done. Second. There's my easy button. Okay. Right. You can do a plus vote. We need to vote. 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 vote on it. Oh, we need I to vote on it. I think a motion to preserve. Okay. So. Second. Then moved and seconded. Got that? All those in favor, please. Oh, let's open. Are we going to Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Okay, then that concludes my I report. can't hear you. What did you say? Justice and Eggers. Yeah. I got them, Jenny. <clears throat> okay, that concludes my report. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Commissioner <laughs> Flowers. Thank you so very much. Um, Commissioner Lotvala, thank you for having an eye on that with Suncoast. That, that's really sad because that used, Suncoast used to be such a phenomenal organization. I served on the board some years ago, so I hope there's some additional information that will come forth and they figure it out, but thank you for sharing that. Um, school starts August 10th, so everybody get ready, be prepared, send your children back, well prepared, safe and ready. Um, the teachers may not want that, but I want that. Um, <laughs> Thank you again. Um, uh, attending the NACO housing conference was huge. We literally took up every single room in that convention center. It was 105 degrees outside, plus with humidity, I think like 115, but we survived. Um, but um, uh, Commissioner um, Peters and Commissioner Scott were all over the place. Um, Commissioner Justice all over the place. So we were well represented in all of the different breakout sessions and congratulations on your board appointments. Um, the um, I had a chance to serve on the panel for the housing conference to provide the outcomes of the national housing task force that I was appointed to. And this is the final product. I know I emailed you guys the draft, but this is the final um, product. So. I do have some additional ones coming that we can share with whomever would desire to get the actual um, toolkit that's being made available um, to all 50 states um, and their county commissioners. Um, career source. On July 19th, myself and Mr. Meyer in the audience um, were required to participate in a um, Zoom conference call, if you will, um, just reviewing the REACH Act, going over information that we've gone over time and time again. I promise to keep you all informed. Nothing was really new um, in that Zoom call. Um, we are still awaiting some focus and direction. And so when we get that, we will provide it. But at this point, everything is still the same as it was last month. So, And that's unfortunate because um, I feel like we're not gonna have enough time to carefully have that dialogue and discussion to make sure that um, with the merger, the service levels for our customers don't decline. Um, and that typically happens when two entities are being brought together. You've gotta to figure out leadership roles. You've gotta figure out um, what your focus is going to be for programs, for job training, um, and then to get that um, into gear. That takes time. Um, computer systems they are two totally different systems that's going to take time and I think the, the persons who will suffer will be our clients because I don't think they'll get a very fluid transfer so um, I just wanted to share that and thank you Mr. Meyer for all that you're doing and I'm, I'm on those calls with you so we feel the pain together <laughs> um, happy workers um, our club the board that I serve on of course, we purchased um, Happy Workers, so it's Happy Workers at our club. We had a ribbon cutting, so the entire facility now is complete thanks to a very, very generous gift in the millions of dollars from an individual. So we were able to complete that. 
Um, and so if you have a chance or if you desire, please feel free to um, give them a call and go down and just visit the new facility and what all we have going on there. Um, I had a chance to meet with Miss Anita Lake and Amanda Payne um, with Amplify um, Clearwater to go over their priorities, talk about the m different things that are happening with them and the direction that they want to go. Um, I, they've already established a great relationship with Marilyn Thurman and others with the Clearwater CRA, but we talked about some other ways that they could partner for some programming that they want to implement. So I um, really and thoroughly enjoy talking to them. And then I serve on PSTA along with um, Commissioner Peters, Commissioner Scott, and Commissioner Lotvala. So PSTA did set the general level for its millage um, and then um, discuss some potential uh, things that will need to be cut to include some routes. There will be uh, conversations with the community to get community input and buy-in prior to our next meeting. So this is just a general announcement. If you're interested and want to attend any of those meetings to give your input, feedback, or what have you re related to um, PSTA and its future, whether it be transportation routes, whether it's mobility on demand or whatever it is, um, please, uh, you can go onto their website at psta.com and you can see the dates and updated information regarding that. Um, and um, HCA, I had my HCA board meeting. I serve as a trustee, um, and I'm just so super excited that HCA Northside and I believe Largo have come on board with the opioid um, uh, program that we have and um, just are super supportive in that area. And I've already shared with uh, Lourdes and others if it's anything that I can relay or continue to serve as that bridge, I'm more than happy to do so. But I'm really appreciative appreciative that HCA Northside and Largo have come on board with that and, and are providing that additional service to um, our community. Um, and that ends my report. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner L uh, Commissioner Latvala. Listen to me. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, Commissioner Flowers. Uh, Barry, just real quickly, on the, uh, the she mentioned the schools reminding us of schools getting started back. And I know there's some perhaps longer-term improvements that the, uh, our staff is looking at for Bel Air. Is there any short-term things that we're looking at where the young man was – was it Bel Air or nursery? I can't, um, Bel Air. Bel Air. Yeah. Where the young uh, uh, kid was killed. Um, uh, are we doing anything – short term to slow traffic down during those dark early hours of the day. Yeah, we've, we've, we've done a couple of things. We've added the RFDs. We've um, restriped. The school has, uh, the school district has relocated the, the stop, stop mm -hmm. the bus stop itself, so that it's now adjacent to a um, signal, well, I don't know if those are counted as signals, but the RRFB and the crosswalk. Um, as opposed to the previous move, which required the kids to cross the street. Um, so um, that's the preliminary uh, items that we have worked on. We continue to uh, pursue the idea of additional lighting um, and how we might do that. It's not, our street lighting districts typically are neighborhood oriented, and that's not what we have in this situation, but we haven't, we haven't given up on that as well. Yeah, well, thank you for that update. I just, I, I would encourage uh, looking at uh, during, again, the dark hours of that morning, uh, lights at the far ends of that area that just are flashing that says, you know, children crossing. Because it, it, it's not enough for the kids to push the button to do it, and if they don't push the button, then there's still no light flashing. So I think we got to go overboard a little bit, and if it's adding lighting for that area uh, early, I think it would be helpful. So. I would encourage you to look at alternatives. Um, right, Commissioner Justice. Sorry. All right, all right, Commissioner Haig. Um, <laughs> I just had a couple of things. Um, I was pleased to spend some time with Senator DeSigli uh, this weekend at the Junior League uh, Back to School Fair. Uh, they partnered with Avara Health down at their uh, Johnny Ruth Clark Center on in uh, 22nd St uh, Street South. Uh, along with the St. Pete College, the Jamerson building there. Great day. Uh, something like 1,100 backpacks stuffed with school supplies uh, distributed to the kids and families. And Avara took care of back to school 
uh, health and uh, dental checkup and immunizations, all that kind of good stuff. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, happy families there. And the other thing is, I was I, I did attend the Big C last week. Uh, it was my turn uh, on the commission calendar to go, uh, but uh, Kelly and Barry had briefed on sand, and they re really didn't want to hear anything more from the county after that. So uh, <laughs> I just kept my seat. Um, and that is it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I have just a few things that I want to bring to your attention uh, and then you may be interested in. Uh, we met with Dr. Sebastian Strom, who was originally from Denmark, and he is the new CEO at Largo Med. I hadn't been in Largo Med since I was on their board of trustees, and if you haven't been there recently, I would encourage you to just go and see and hear all about the new things that are going on there. It was just absolutely incredible. Their leadership team has more robotic types of medicine going on. It, we have that right here in our community, and it was pretty extraordinary. And I want to thank Brian Lowack for the incredible job he did with his staff at the downtown St. Pete Pride Parade. He just had it running like a clock and everybody was so excited to be over there. We also went over and met with him at the uh, offices of Visit St. Pete Clearwater and it was pretty extraordinary to see the way in which the staff were interacting with Brian and really appreciating his paying attention to their concerns and details. And so I was tickled as I could be about that. This is a little late, Commissioner Flowers, but I wanted us as a county commission to be able to congratulate you on your appointment as second vice president on the FAC board. It, it takes some, a while to get there, and it's a very serious position, and we're very grateful that we have someone from our county at that level of their leadership. Thank you. I was also pleased to see Governor Bush at FAC. Um, yeah, it was good. It was, good. It, was, it was kind of interesting to see how his whole persona has mm -hmm. grown over the years since he's left public office. And so that was nice catching up with him. And the one thing that I absolutely just loved was the keynote speaker at the very end of FAC. For those of you who were not there, it was a real, true American hero mm -hmm. by the name of Mark Nutch, mm -hmm. who was part of one of the first uh, troops deployed to Afghanistan right after 9-11. And he wrote a book all about the experience of being, it was his unit that was part of the horse soldiers, mm -hmm. and they are the ones who started the, that, um, What's the day? Urban or, Still House yeah. in or, downtown. Or Soldier. Or Soldier. Yeah. Or Soldiers, right. yeah. And so if you haven't seen that movie, it's extraordinary film. Yeah. And to be able to talk to him and buy the book and have it signed by him, I'm going to give it to my oldest son as a gift for Christmas. Hopefully yeah. he's not watching. Yeah. No, he's not watching. He's not watching. And may I ta take a point of personal <laughs> privilege to say Right now, as we speak, he is fl taking his very first flight as a first officer on Allegiant Air. And he has successfully completed his transition from rotor to jets. And he's just so like a little kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I am too. I wish I could be with him, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, but I'm so happy to be here with all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same, but you know what I mean. And we also went down and visited the, it's not new anymore, but oh my Lord, if you haven't taken a, a tour of the police station in downtown St. Petersburg, I've never seen anything like it. it. Nice. The technology in there was outstanding and they are able to do things right here yeah. in our county, not being done anywhere else. So I was very proud of that as well. And then uh, we did have the Park Tampa Bay Partnership Regional Roundtable, which was a group of five county commissioners and private business leaders from all over our region who um, 
discuss the importance of pre-K through eighth grade education and how it impacts workforce development. I found that extremely interesting. They also talked about the Juvenile Welfare Board launching the program focused on the 1,000 days of a child's life. Turbo babies. Turbo babies. Imagine that. that, turbo babies. <laughs> they, they, they actually have a website called turbobabies.com. If you're interested, Thrive by Five is their ultimate goal, which is a network in Pinellas promoting the development of children from zero to five. It brings together caregivers, agencies, business, and civic officials to amplify access to all the services and resources available to families. One of the things that they highlighted a lot, and you may, you may be learning about this as well, Commissioner Latvala, since you're on that board, is this big issue about availability of child care and the need to work with our business partners and schools to create more options in that particular area. It's always been an issue, and how we don't find a way to wrap our arms around that continues to boggle my mind. But keep that in mind as you move forward in your work on the different boards you sit on. Another big uh, program that was touched on during that particular discussion was having the CEOs of the largest corporations in our school. Apparently it's in its fourth year now and has been really well received. Um, they're, they're moving that program along very nicely with the idea of trying to give young kids an interest in any given field that they might may not in their own little world be, be otherwise exposed to. And then you, excuse me, you all know that we recently had our countywide oversight committee meeting and I wanted to give a great big shout out to Jewel White who has really impressed us over the years with her leadership. And if you haven't been over to visit her offices, I would suggest you do so because if you were up over there years ago, it's a brand new place in terms of what she's done over there. So kudos to you, Jewel. Um, and that meeting that you referenced, Commissioner Eggers, with Forward Pinellas is an emergency meeting that we have to have to be able to finish that apportionment work because we did not have enough attendance at our last meeting. So attendance is a really big deal when you're serving on these boards. And a lot of great work gets grinding to a halt when they don't have quorums at our board meetings. Um, I could go on because there's a lot to report on, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to say a congratulations from the County Commission to James Bradford, who's uh, a, got a very big position at PSTA and was recently recognized nationwide for, <laughs> for his work in leadership. Um, I was really excited to see that. Um, as for the TDC, it continues to move along under Brian Lowack's leadership, and I want you all to know, I hope you'll take the opportunity to go over to their office and just take a visit because it's a whole new atmosphere over there, and I think you'll have a lot of very interesting, innovative, and very bold ideas coming forth in the weeks and months ahead, so stay tuned. And that ends my report for today. Is there anything else that we forgot or did not address it? Voting on the TDC. two positions. HFA and TDC. Oh. Ballots for those. Oh, you have ballots, Daryl Lynn. How on earth did I miss that? Oh, because I got all caught, caught up in my own report. Sorry. Editing. What did he say? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Peters did um, cast her vote before she left for the TDC. Here you go. Okay. And then, do you have ballots, Daryl Lynn, for the Housing Finance Authority? Yes, I do. Okay.
The board has selected Mayor Dave Gaddis for TDC nomination. Okay, I've got the other one. The other one is the Housing Authority. I just find it amusing, that's all. What? I didn't hear the amusing. Everyone folds their ballots like it's some secret thing when it's... Oh, know. just a habit. <laughs> you know, I, it's just a habit. I just don't want to use I don't it. want Commissioner Eggers... I was going to say the same them. thing about... Well, yeah, we don't want any cheating. It's not a test. <laughs> okay, whatever. Oh, yeah. Henson and Pierce. Oh, we should have some. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, there we go. Keep another one just between these two. Do we do sometimes? Okay. You, we have a tie. <laughs> of course we do. We'll see you next month. I, what I would recommend is that you all take another vote between the two members that were the tie vote, which is Audrey Henson and John Pierce. So there was a three three one? Correct. Yes. Mm, okay. uh, our, our lone vote remains here on the dais. So in theory we could have a So you would under so your you, proposal, the Commissioner Peters vote would maintain. No, my recommendation is that the six of you vote between the two members that received the tie votes. It was the six of us that voted on the last one, wasn't it? Seven. Seven, Seven because Commissioner Peters. Oh, because this right. is not a secret, Commissioner Long was the lone vote for the one person that did not make it into what I will call the tiebreaker. <laughs> so it's okay if you look at other people's <laughs> ballots. <if you> <laughs> It is absolutely okay. <laughs> that's oh, that's just why like your, your names are at the top of them. Oh, Charlie! And it was red and green buttons up there. <laughs> On TV. So I'm gonna bring in some little. These are sunshine. These are sunshine votes, and that's why your name appears at the top of the ballot, so that we have on record who, how everybody voted, just like we do with every other vote that you undertake. I mean, it's all public. The board has selected Audrey Henson. Okay, are we happy, Commissioner Justice? Well, that's that's a whole separate question. Um, <laughs> Never mind. It, it, I take it, does, it back. It does Don't bring up it. it does bring up a question about our process. Is when we have someone absent, you know, in the legislature, you could record a vote after, but it didn't impact the vote. We don't. We've never talked about that as someone recording a vote and then leaving for whatever reason they left. So, do we have a process officially, or did we just make one up today? You do not have an official process in place. Um, recognizing that there were tie issues last time, I did ask Commissioner Peters to fill out the two ballots, not for this one that we did not anticipate would, would occur, but we did in fact know that those two votes were going to be occurring today. So I recommended that she fill out those two ballots. The second one for a tie break, we did not know was going to be occurring, so I don't think it is appropriate to use her vote there because she cast it for what would have been the first round. But we don't. You do Unlike not have an official process. We don't have any formal rules. You do not. Do we have to have any, or can we? How does this happen? Not necessarily. No, you don't have to have any. We don't have official rules. No. Well, as far as how you want to handle tie breaks and things of that nature, it's it's. For instance, we saw with the CR. I think it was the CRC. Uh, we had some ties, and you all decided, or I forget exactly how it was, but you all decided to handle things one way. Um, if you all wish to have some procedures on this, we can certainly sit down and brainstorm some things. I mean, I think at maybe like next year or something, we should sure. look at having official rules. But one of the questions when I first got elected was, you know, what are our rules? And I was interested in learning that we didn't have any rules. 
Well, to that point, Commissioner Flowers, um, Commissioner Peters had a lot of discussion when, we, when she first came on the board about the fact that there were no processes or anything written down for the fifth floor. And so we proceeded to establish a manual. Do you remember that, Barry? Mm -hmm. Well, the manual, I don't know if anyone has taken the time to look at it. It was done by, I think, Courtney and, well, you were chair at the time, weren't you, Commissioner Justice? It's, it was been an evolving process over several years. Yes, and Jewel had a big impact in it. That manual, which I think in most organizations it's probably like this, is, is a big, it's voluminous, big, voluminous, three or four hundred page document. Oh dear. That point that you just <laughs> yeah. raised, though, about policy and issues, I don't believe we have any as it relates to board members on the TDC, and it seems to me maybe you might I mean, not all agree but there ought to be some criteria about who sits on a board on a, a tourism driven industry board that has implemented a tax on themselves and that anyone who's on that board should be representing a heavily um, a heavy tourism area and I do believe that if you look at all the candidates that were on there, there were some candidates who you can match where they're from to the number of tourists that they bring into the county, and then your decision about who sits on the board might be substantially different. And I don't know if any of you think that way or agree to that, but just thought. We can talk about it more, but if there's nothing else and everybody's grinning, but so be it. Okay, I think we're done, unless there's something else that needs to be said. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>